to the degree that you want something is the degree you're afraid of not having. Yeah. God, I wish I started when I was younger. I go, well, yeah, but you didn't. So shut the fuck up and let's <laughs> right. keep going. Right. Like, you can't, yeah. <laughs> Nobody changes until they change their energy. And when you change your energy, you change your life. Because it's not till then that it's really real. Yeah. It's like, oh, this is way worse than I thought. It's like, oh, yeah, it's way, way worse than you thought. Yeah. But luckily, there's more to you than you think. All right, family. Here we are, Christine, Steph, Vilana. We have gathered, and we have gathered because we're going to talk about a really important topic—a topic that oftentimes we think, like, "Oh, yeah, this is kind of sorted, and this is kind of handled, and we got this covered." The dynamic between the masculine and feminine, but it goes so deep. Mm. There's just layer under layer under layer. And to set this up, let me tell a little story. So you guys came out as master coaches for the Fit for Service Mastermind in Sedona, and you were leading a workshop that was offering healing between the masculine and feminine. So we did one exercise, which was fantastic, which we can get into, but the exercise that I'm going to refer to was when you had the women circle up in a long oval in the center, and then you asked the men to kneel in reverence at their feet, place their hands on their feet, and just bow in reverence to the feminine. And myself, I'm pretty savvy with things, I think. I believe that I'm in touch with what's going on and what's going to be impactful. I've been a coach for a while, and I've been to a ton of these different workshops, and I thought, this is a really beautiful and sweet idea. I'm glad we're doing this. This is a lovely idea. That was what was going through my head. And so I go down, this is a lovely honoring practice. And I was in a, in a kind of just peaceful honoring and then i heard the first woman break out in tears and not just any type of tears but like a like a screaming guttural uttering of tears and then the next one and then the next one until 60 women were just weeping and some of the men were weeping and i went oh my god like there is so much more here than we even realize so much so many layers deeper so i'll turn this over to you guys now to kind of talk about what prompted you to kind of come up with that come up with that exercise and what was actually going on what was the reason that this was all coming forward in both the masculine and the feminine well, I think a lot of things prompted it, including our own relationship and the healing that we've done with masculine and feminine energetics inside us and being committed to sacred union. And me as a woman experiencing more the feminine energetic and him as a man experiencing both more the masculine energetic and me doing a lot of work with all people, but especially women and him doing a lot of men's work, we see how deep the wound runs with men and women that masculine and feminine wound. The feminine has been very hurt by the masculine and the masculine has been very hurt by the feminine. And it, yet at the same time, the masculine yearns for the love of the feminine and the feminine yearns for the love of the masculine. And there's so much healing that can happen without words. And so for us, facilitating that process was about taking the words out and just allowing the energy, the simple energy of the masculine really bowing to and revering the feminine to take over. Because sometimes when we get into the words and the processing and the talking, we can miss out on the energetics. And before we did that exercise, if you remember, we did another exercise where the men and women are on opposite sides of the room and they were mm -hmm. stepping forward mm -hmm. when they were relating to something like, have you been Might abused? Well just, have I, you been I, ref I referenced that, you're referencing that. Might as well set it up yeah. and just explain that one too, because that was also a really powerful opening it was, prior to the one that I mentioned. Yeah, And as a bonus, we actually recorded a process for all the listeners as like a free thing so they can take themselves Ooh, through it. <laughs> so yes. we'll, we'll talk about that before we end. But so we'll... Do you want to talk about the the setup and yeah, beforehand? Yeah. So, and it's a really interesting question because for us, both of us, when we set these experiences up, I personally, I won't speak for Christine, but I personally am thinking, what do I need as a young person? 
What do I need as a young man that I didn't get? What were the role models that I needed? What were the experiences that I really had to have in order to make me feel more full and connected, not only to myself, to, to not to have a greater awareness of myself, to have deeper self-confidence, to, to not mask uh, my shadows with false bravado. And that deep reverence, that honoring, my example of healthy masculinity didn't exist in my life. My, my grandfather, who I adored deeply, was very passive. And my father it was very aggressive. And there were extremes there and I was so confused as a kid and revering the feminine was very difficult or any representation of that. And so that bowing exercise was something that I needed because I objectified women as a young man. I saw them as tools almost. I didn't, I didn't understand the, 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 the deep connection there and I lost myself in that space. And having met Christine, having done deeper work on myself prior to that, a whole new dynamic was open for me in terms of I get to respect this woman for who she is, her qualities, her beauty, her wonder, but all of her, not, not, not just the convenient parts, like all of her. And in order for me to really appreciate all of her, which I unpack and uncover every day, I have to appreciate all of me. And so that, that bowing exercise for me was something I did by myself in terms of visualizations was something that I've done in, you know, in, in previous experiences in different ways. And it opened up my heart in such a way that the intimacy was there. There was no, there was no armor around my heart anymore. And I mean, I knew that if we stay there long enough without words, because in stillness and silence, there's so much power that something would crack open and reveal itself. Mm -hmm. And, and before that, so the, what we did is we had people, the men stand on one side and the women stand on the other side. And no matter what your sexual orientation is, you're, if you're in a male body, your experience is different than if you're in a female body. And the point of that was we wanted men and women to just be looking at each other. And we would call out different things, different experiences, like, like I was saying, have you been betrayed? Have you ever cheated? Have you been cheated on? Have you been sexually abused? So on and so forth. That And that moment, mm. you know, that moment was also just devastating yes. yeah. you know because we go through all of these different all of these different categories like this have you been cheated on have you been felt betrayed has you know one of your parents yelled at you and uh, you know there's a whole host of things you're like yep yeah, yep yeah. and you, people move through and some of them are emotional have you had experience with an alcoholic or whatever whatever the things were that were kind of coming up and there's myriad things it can yeah. do but when you called have you ever been sexually abused and i watched yeah <laughs> men and men and women and pretty much all of the women and yeah and, and that was actually yeah. for me i'm already getting emotional um the rest of the process was so beautiful to just be able to see people and how alike we are in our challenge and and suffering and pain and stepping forward to that one and looking the person across from me in the eyes there was something about what was being held in my body in relation to that that I just broke out sobbing inconsolably. I mean, the rest of the time it was emotional and I could feel other people's experience, but you know, we're not speaking. One of the things we didn't do was speak to anybody. We didn't try to hold them or save them mm. or console them from anything. You're just present, you know, looking at, for me, I'm, you know, I'm a woman, so I'm looking at the masculine. For those who are stepping forward, I'm seeing them in the same experience that I've had. But that one in particular, to see so many and to feel how deep that runs and to also just be seen in that pain yeah, was massively healing for me and a huge energetic release and just allowing myself to grieve it. Yeah, it really was in so many ways a shame exercise. Mm. Yeah. So, and and I said this during the process, like the point of talking about an experience like sexual abuse wasn't to bring people back into the experience or back into their trauma. In fact, we purposely had people stepping forward across the line if that happened to them. Like you're stepping forward into the light, into the love, into compassion, into union with others who've had that experience. And that's the way shame heals. Shame heals when we take something out of the shadows, we take something out of the secrets, we take something out of being buried deep in our past and we bring it into light and we say, okay, like I'm, a, I, people can see me. People can see me with this and I'm still loved and I'm safe and I'm not alone. Because a lot of us with our shame, we feel so isolated in it. 
yeah, and it debilitates us. And that for us, that exercise is, it's relatability creates intimacy mm. and intimacy runs parallel with safety. And when we feel safe, we feel open and we're ready to, you know, move into the world in such a way that is, is more authentic to us as opposed to moving in our shadows, which is hiding and essentially isolating again. Yeah, so true. Yeah, that was, I mean, it was a beautiful setup for this. And and I was one of the few that was, who didn't step forward in the, when they called sexual abuse mm. of, of the men and the women. And I remember both witnessing everybody moving forward and just recognizing like, I'm in the dramatic minority of mm. humans, 160 conscious yep. individuals, mm -hmm. and I'm in the minority and I'm looking around. And, and for me to recognize like how pervasive that is and how blessed I am that I wasn't stepping forward. And then to see so many of my brothers and sisters that I love, including you know, my partner that I love, everybody stepping to the center. It was like, holy shit. Yeah. Like this is the world that we're in. And we think, you know, we're all so busy blaming and projecting and, oh, I can't believe they're acting like this. Mm -hmm. Do you know what they went through? Yeah, exactly. Do you know what's inside? Yeah. You know, before you cast all your blame and all of your judgment and start talking shit about this person, like, do you have any idea what they had to deal with and what their defense mechanisms were and what, how they've, their coping strategies and what they've had to do? No, you fucking don't. You really don't. So like everybody giving a little bit of grace and a little bit of love to, to everybody, no matter how they express themselves. Yeah. And we think so often that women often think that men don't understand or experience something <laughs> and men will think the same about women and seeing that, I think it's important to see your mirror in the opposite sex, yeah. the opposite gender, because that's part of sacred union that's part of healing the feminine and masculine and and if we look collectively those wounds are really coming up right right now and for a group of people to be willing to come together and heal that within themselves because whatever we heal inside ourselves we're contributing to the healing of the collective and even though the men were standing on one side and the women were on the other i felt so much unity in that experience and so much just family and and compassion and to because we had the unique experience of facilitating so we we could see both sides and it was incredible for me to see the men to just see their hearts open and to see them just go into just this incredible compassion and the women their hearts open even more but also their minds open to oh wow men go through a lot more than I even knew. You know, I knew my sisters went through a lot of this stuff, but I think a lot of women were surprised at the amount of men, oops, the amount of men that stepped forward in that, especially that sexual abuse question. Absolutely. What are you What are you feeling right now, Vi? I I don't know why I got so emotional. I think um, I think an aspect of it is um, just so much compassion because yeah. I know going through my own pain. Um, so to just like, I feel other people a lot. So to like really feel into the group and how much love I have for them. Um, I'm not sure why I'm getting so emotional, but uh, the thing that I I really did love is is exactly what you just said. One of the last thing that you guys said when you guided us through this practice was we're so much more alike than we are different. Mm -hmm. You know, we're so quick to point out the differences and what the other is done doing wrong and to blame but to just like see each other in the same experience is so incredibly powerful and incredibly healing as you know the mirror of the masculine and the feminine like like nothing else i've ever experienced before it was a deeply profound experience for me and that you getting emotional there is the power <laughs> of the feminine mm. and so many women have been told you're too emotional you're too sensitive you're too dramatic you're too fill on the blank mm -hmm. but that compassion and the emotion that comes through you that's that's the beauty one of the many gifts of the feminine mm -hmm. is our ability and it's not that men can't feel or don't feel but there's this this depth of compassion that that mother inside of us yeah. that just wants to hug the entire world and it's it was beautiful to see the men in that way too yeah so open and so vulnerable and so yeah. compassionate of their brothers and sisters you know like that is really really special and i can say from my own personal perspective a man who allows himself to be vulnerable is incredibly courageous there is nothing weak about that mm -hmm. at all 
And it is a it is a beautiful thing as the feminine to witness a man in his vulnerability. Mm. It's that it's that compassion, that non judgment from the feminine when she opens in that way that cracks open our hearts. So I'll speak from my own direct experience. That has literally saved my life. Mm. Where I've had uh, that feminine energetic be so open to me and see me in all my flaws, or my perceived flaws, in all my pain, in all my shadows, in all the quote unquote disgusting behavior and everything that I've been and haven't been and still just love me for who I am beyond the superficiality of action, but not to excuse my action or to diffuse responsibility, but to just really see me. And that men need that. We, we saw, we witnessed in that, in that exercise alone, how many more men have experienced very deep visceral abuse than what we believe to be mm -hmm. true. And the same is actually for females as well. And how many mm -hmm. men were cheated on as well. Oh, mm -hmm, absolutely. Yeah. And the pain that's associated with those experiences, they're shared human experiences. Yeah. And I think we also, you know, one of the things we talked about was the king and queen archetype. And we, you know, while they're similar in some ways, they're also different in some ways. And I think noticing too that in partnership with the masculine and feminine in union together, you know, as if you're in your king archetype, sometimes emotion, you don't have the time or the space for emotions because it's about action. It's about keeping calm and cool and acting logically. And if you're emotional, it can actually throw off your decisions in a variety of different ways. As, you know, Joe Rogan has said, which is absolutely true, emotions are not a warrior's friend. They're not a king's friend. When you're emotional, you don't act in the most clearly and logical way. So sometimes you can become callous and I've certainly been you know, at fault for that. But when you love someone deeply, like I love Vi, and then you see her cry, then it's like, there's no escape. Mm -hmm. Like there's no escape from the emotions, right? Like you can't, you can't push this off as different because you're so closely bonded together. And I think that's a sacred aspect of it that if you are callous and either your feminine energy or the feminine energy of your partner, we have both inside of us. It doesn't matter man or woman, but mm -hmm. whoever's in the feminine that you love that person, like them accessing those feelings is like a wake up call, you know, cause I remember when we watched, you know, operation Toussaint about, mm -hmm. you know, the child slavery and sex trafficking, like I'm sure that would have deeply moved me on its own. But the fact that I was seeing my partner, like, just really feeling the depths of compassion for those kids it was like it allowed me it like gave me the doorway for me to feel it too in uh in a really powerful way so i think that's just one of the aspects of union that are really valuable that the feminine has the freedom to completely feel everything and then that can help the masculine aspect like see and feel and see through that lens and then also the masculine can then step out of that and say, I feel that and I see that, but now it's time for action. What are we going to do? You know, in, in mm -hmm. that case with Tim Ballard, just, all right, I'm getting on the phone with Tim Ballard. We're going to make sure he comes out here. We're going to do a podcast. I'm going to gather the resources. I'm going to donate to his cause and we're going to make mm -hmm. this happen. And it, but it was the, the perfect synergy of, you know, she's supporting me and feeling the feeling and then the masculine going like, all right, now I dry my tears. Now I mm. get on my phone. That inspires you to take action. Exactly. And then, and then there was nothing that was going to stop me from, from doing that. And before the feminine can open up to that emotion that calls the masculine forward, she needs to feel safe, mm. which is right. why in the exercise, we had the men bow to the feminine and do their process. So we made our way back <laughs> to the exercise, a long emotional journey <laughs> that takes us back to the beginning of where we were starting here. This doesn't have to be linear at all. <laughs> I am the feminine, so. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's that, it's that safety that's so important. I know for me, I'm, I'm assuming it's the same for you, for me to really open up emotionally, sexually, I have to feel safe. Mm -hmm. I have to feel like there's a safe container. Like this is a man who respects me and reveres me and it can hold, you know? And that's why we had the men hold that bowing position for so long. It's like, I'm not, no matter how uncomfortable my back is, no matter how much my knees hurt, 
I'm not going anywhere. And no matter how much you cry or whatever, like I'm still here. Mm -hmm. And that for me, not to say that we can't open up and be emotional without that, but especially in relationship and sacred union, that kind of safety gives us this incredible permission and freedom to be like, oh, I can feel everything. Mm -hmm. Because I know for me, it's, I had to shut a lot of that down because it was just too overwhelming. Like my empathy and compassion and sensitivity runs deep. And I all went into my masculine almost as a protective strategy because it was just too much to feel. Same. But in our relationships and stuff holds such a healthy masculine for me, it gives me that safety to be like, okay, I can feel everything because I'm not going to fall apart. Like there's, there's a sturdiness there and a steadiness there that can hold me in that and can also help me with his masculine energy go, okay, what are we going to do about it? You know, and that's mm -hmm. that beauty of that sacred union is how the feminine and masculine energies work together to to create a, a whole different level of being and relating and acting. Mm. You know, some may perceive that as a fragility in the feminine or an overpowering energy in the masculine. It's not mm -mm. the case in any capacity because that ability to feel full is presence. It's living in the moment. It's not distracting from the pain of the past or the projections into the future. Mm -hmm. And that that ability to feel fullness inspires me so deeply to come and ground into the space that I'm in here and now and not and not get off into this I need to feel expansive freedom and there's an excessiveness in that, right? And it grounds me. And so I think that the the power that we get to play with with each other in sacred union and within ourselves, right? Because I think the outside reflection of our, of each other in our communities and in the people that we love and care for can also be a mirror for what's happening inside and, and vice versa. And th but there's something more tangible about the outside self. Like the inside self, it's, it's almost abstract. It's like, what does this thought mean? And what is that thought? And this part of me and that part of me, I don't get it. But when I see Christine behaving and being in a particular way, it's more solid for me. It's more concrete for me. And I can use that as a reflection for what's happening within myself and strike a greater mm -hmm. balance and harmony. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in that, <clears throat> in getting back into that, you know, the the physical act and and i know people who might be like well that's a little bit much but it's not because we both should be bowing in reverence to each other right and i think one of the things why people might have resistance is everybody's been trying to claim some kind of hierarchy or some right. kind of superiority yeah. you know yeah. and you know for all of the good that the feminist movement has done it's also had that the dark side yes. of it which is that you know women are good men are bad yeah. You know, and so it that actually prevents men from wanting to do something like this, which is yeah. about this. Because if we're told we're bad all the time, we're like, well, fuck you too. Yeah. yeah. You know, because I'm not bad. You know, I've done bad things. So have the feminine. Like, we've all done bad things. And so it feels unfair. And then it actually creates the distance. It actually creates the antithesis, the opposite of yeah. what the movement is really looking for, which mm -hmm. is reverence. So if you're listening and you have some of that, you know, just track where that resistance comes yeah. from. And then, and then recognize that this is a practice that we should all engage in in some way or another. This was the very literal form of the practice, but in some way, literally or figuratively, we should bow before each other physically or energetically. And, and I think that's a really important aspect. Even Don Miguel Ruiz in Mastery of Love, he talks about creating a puja, which is like a, a worshiping ritual and he talks about creating it for self or for other, you know, where you actually go every day, just as you would to your, you know, your gods in the in the Hindu tradition, which is where the word comes from. Like you would go, you know, pay your reverence to Shiva every day, or pay your reverence to Ganesha every day, or pay your reverence to, you know, whoever. L doing that for each other can be like I think a really healthy part of the process. But for someone who's never experienced that, which mm -hmm. is where we were at, like not only in the physical, but also in the energetic, not ever really getting bowed to, I think that's what facilitated it. It was that watershed moment of, of wow, mm -hmm. you know, like this is really happening. And then you flipped it also, which I definitely want to get into, yeah. where you flipped it where the women were holding the men's hearts. And so, so talk about, you know, obviously riff off anything that I mentioned in that, that little part, but then also talk about how that, then how then you had us stand up and then how you actually turned it so that it was really comprehensive and accessed kind yeah. of both 
both sides of reverence. Well, I love what you said about finding that that time to just have reverence and respect your your partner or just anyone, honestly, because and every, people listening know this, anything that triggers you in another is an unresolved issue in yourself. Either it's a part of you that you haven't looked at or it's reminding you of someone that has hurt you. Those are the, the t- only two, two th- only two things it usually is. And in in partnership or just with men and women, there's so much we hold on to. If you're a woman whose father was abusive or abandoned you or cheated on your mother your whole life, unless you've worked through it, you're gonna have some judgments and anger at the masculine. And so it's important to look at that and eventually get to the point where you can not hold this massive judgment against the masculine that continues to create separation. And same thing with men. If you had a mother or women that have hurt you and lied to you and teased you or whatever it is, you're gonna have some anger at women. And if we can let that be okay, get that anger out and however we, in a, in a safe therapeutic way, and then get to a point where we can just bow to each other metaphorically and sometimes physically, it opens up so much freedom inside of us. I know for me, when, cause the shadow of the feminist movement is definitely a thing. Like I'm, I, I'm very much, I'm pro-human, you know? <laughs> I just want all humans to experience unity and consciousness and all of these things. Uh, but for a movement to get started at that current level of consciousness, it needed anger as fuel. Mm. That was the only way it was going to happen because the consciousness wasn't at a state where it's like, we can do this with love. No problem. We can do this with love and forgiveness. Women had thousands and thousands of years of anger, rightfully so, against the masculine. So it needed that anger to get it going. But now I think it's up to us to up-level it to really shift it so it's not riding on the energetic of anger, but it's more riding on the energetic of how do we heal these wounds between the masculine and the feminine? Do you wanna talk about then what we did next with flipping it? Do you want me to? Yeah, I'm gonna come back to what I said earlier around that compassion, that non-judgment and that forgiveness as well. That hand on the heart is so symbolic. We know that symbolism is the oldest language that humanity has access to. And that hand on the heart is... And so just to be clear, yeah. so the men stood up, the women yeah. placed the hand on the men's heart. Yeah. yeah. So and this was the reverse of the men bowing at the feet. Yeah. And another before, example of another that. Example. Before they mm-hmm. did that, and this is all in the recording we made for you, um, the men shared something. So after they got up from bowing, mm-hmm. they really spoke some things mm-hmm. and took off masks and shared vulnerability. And the women oh, just indeed. got to receive yeah. that yeah. vulnerability. And hear them as well. Which further, you know, cracked everybody open. Because um, a lot of times we we listen without hearing. Mm-hmm. So re- the men being able to speak in a facilitated way and the women just listen, it was more receiving and more healing. And then after that, the the men were quiet and it w- we flipped it to the women and we had the woman in reverence put her hand on the man's heart. Yeah, and, and express in reverence as well. I mean, there were very few words spoken. That was the whole point. Mm-hmm. It was really being in each other's presence without obstruction, without the busyness of life, without what's the next thing to do, without actually just feeling safe, feeling safe in a container where everyone could access openness and and be in their own space without judgment of themselves either. And, and hear, hear people crying. Mm-hmm and wallowing in pain and expressing that pain and releasing it and that being okay, that not being a bad thing, that not being the end of the world. And the comeback from that, what is what is the next arc of the journey look like and feel like for every single person there? And that hand on the heart is so symbolic and so empowering of, I see you for who you are. I trust you. I love you. It's okay who you've been and it's okay who you're becoming. That's that's That for me is is super powerful and super needed in our world. If we're going to bridge any gap of not being able to celebrate difference and not being able to see each other for the similarities that we do hold and also honor the differences that we hold. And these and these two were potentially people who didn't know each other yeah. very yeah. well. For for me, one of my partners was somebody that I met for the first time. So to have such a deeply moving and intimate moment with a yeah. stranger I mean, I'll never forget that my whole life. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't need to be your partner or a friend. Like that level of intimacy can happen with 
anybody. Yeah. And I guarantee nobody that experienced that day will ever forget. That's how that's it was what's so him. powerful. I remember I was on a I was on the summit boat. Uh, you might have been on that same mm-hmm. on that same boat probably that time. And there was a poet named Aja Monet, and she led us led people through an eye gazing exercise where it was not just eye gazing, but it was looking at the face and seeing the way that the mm-hmm. wrinkles and the lines of the face and the shape of their experience and where they'd smiled and how many times they'd frowned and like we went through this fifteen minute guided meditation, looking at each other from the eyes to all aspects of the face, the nose and the smells they've breathed, the food they've tasted, the way that everything has happened. And I remember that was at the start of the of the boat, but. For the whole rest of the time, whenever I crossed that person, we gave each other like the biggest hug, total stranger. (laughs) Didn't stay in touch after that, but it was like, oh, this person I know, like I know their soul, Mm -hmm. like we got to do that. And it's so quick to be able to form that. And then once you realize that you can do that with a total stranger, then you realize that you can do that with anybody. You know, and with Fit for Service, they weren't total strangers. I mean, we've been communicating, but they were people that we didn't know that well. And and those members that I went through that process with, like, we'll always, for the rest of our life, have that connection. Yeah. You know, and and that's that's something that's really powerful. And it's also nice because instead of it being, instead of you thinking of, like, actual examples, you know, Vi and I's relationship is fairly young, so we wouldn't have ways to go back. But let's say a partnership that's been, five years, 10 Mm -hmm. years, 20 years, and you had us prompting by saying, I'm sorry for any variety of these experiences Mm -hmm. in which I hurt you. Mm -hmm. Well, you would be thinking about the literal. Like, yeah, yeah, that one time when you did this fucking thing. (laughs) Well, but no, we weren't thinking about that because we were apologizing on behalf of the entirety of the feminine or the entirety of the masculine, which then allowed you to go to the real deep roots of it without personalizing it at Mm, all and i think that was also like really important and and a a brilliant thing it's one of the reasons why i think having people separated was really key and i actually got feedback that you know at some point somebody moved to be with their partner Mm -hmm. and it really disrupted the experience you know Mm -hmm. they just kind of like bounced because they needed it was so powerful they wanted to be with them but it ultimately was disruptive because it's not the way it was supposed to be right you know, it was supposed to learn to be held by the whole group mm. and by like the random. Because man, I was going back when the when you know, and it was uh, it was Britt actually who had her hand on my heart, which is great. She's one of our sisters in the in the tribe, and she was apologizing on behalf of the feminine. I was thinking of you know girlfriends all the way back to when I was twelve, or mm. people who I was in love with when I was twelve. You know. Mm-hmm. There was, I mean, I could name them actually because the imprint is so strong, you know, but like, (laughs) but like all of those rejections, you know, and I I think for the, for men, I think a lot of, a lot of what we hold, and then I would love to open it up, you know, to you, Steph, to talk about it, see if you have any kind of affinity for what I'm saying and resonance with what I'm saying. There was a time when we were young, and maybe this is just me, but I don't think it. I don't. I think it's probably more universal. Where we were really like, really like somebody, and we were just hard on our sleeve. Like I really like you, like I like you so much. And for me, that meant I was writing him poetry, and I was like, I wanted to give him gifts, or I would pick him flowers. I was like a little romantic <laughs> at heart, right? <laughs> and every I single until I was tw- mm-hmm. until I was twenty one, I would do that with everybody. And I would get rejected every time. And then somebody else who I wasn't that interested in, who would like talk to me like, hey, what's up, blah, blah, blah. They'd be like, oh, wow, I like this guy. And so I was always with the person that I wasn't fully that interested yeah, in because yeah, the yeah. one who I would really try. And there was, there was so much wounding in that. And then I would see them with somebody else who didn't even really like them, treating them badly, breaking up with them, cheating on them. And I'd be like, but I love you though. <laughs> And I'm pretty great, I thought at least. I don't know what's the what's the deal. So the like the wounding of that yeah. experience of like when we really show up and say I love you so much, and the people are like ew, gross. Yeah, you know. And then that's a that's a difficult that's a difficult thing for the masculine. I'm sure that happens from on the feminine oh, perspective. Does. But we'll but we'll go <laughs> we'll go through. So so I'll turn that over to you, Steph, and see if like. Was that a part of your experience as a For man? Sure. Oh, one hundred percent. I remember with my grandmother, I would tell her, um, "I like this girl at school." I was maybe like ten, eleven, twelve years old, and she'd. 
give me what's called a Kit Kat. You have Kit Kats yeah, here? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Give me a Kit Kat and I'd put $2 in the Kit Kat and I'd wrap it up in cellophane. You put that. money in it? I'd put $2 in cellophane. <laughs> <sex. laughs> oh, I was fucking What was, was the behind the money? I, was ten, I don't know. It was a gift, 10, 11 <laughs> years yes. old. I was... Because, and I'm gonna, actually, I'm going to tell you why. It's a great I'm question. Buy a milk. Okay, it's, a great, it's a great question. I'm going to tell you why. Because for me, it was a form of buying love. And, um, and, and what, what really I really wanted when I look back at that and reflect was my father's love. I wanted my father's approval. I wanted his adoration. And the constant state, and, and, and that, that particular girl, name was Katie. It was great. Um, <laughs> I had like seven Katie's. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, Katie's. Dang very Four American Ashley's, name. seven <laughs> Katie's. You know, like a few a, Stephanie's, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> yeah a few Stephanie's, Tiffany's couple Sarah's. And, <laughs> yeah. But, you know, she, she rejected me and she only wanted to be friends and it broke my heart. And, you know, Did we she take the Kit Kat and the oh, money? Yeah, Oh. Fucking oath she took the oh, <laughs> yeah. Of course she would. <laughs> um, and so it was, you know, we recreate, and we speak about this a lot, mm. we recreate the circumstances in our lives that give us an opportunity to heal those wounds. And we're so much more attentive and smarter and intelligent than we think we are when we're children. And really I would set myself up with people that I really wanted to be with or I was attracted to, I was attracted to something within them, only to guarantee my rejection and humiliation because that's what I experienced with that not having the approval and the adoration of my father, you know, and, and unconsciously there was a tethering tied to that, that I wanted, I wanted that approval and so where could I seek that? Mm -hmm. And of course – being, being a young kid and growing up and, and the beginning stages of hormones as well, early, you know, 10, 11, 12, early, but still there, maybe not even that early. Um, and feeling that in my body, it's, oh, where can I delve into intimacy really deeply? Mm -hmm. And then maybe experience that not rejection, not abandonment, and actually have someone see me for who I was. And now at the time I didn't understand that. I didn't feel that. But that pain, that, and, and rejection is a human thing. Abandonment's a human thing. Humiliation's a human thing. But men particularly because we, we place so much of our value and worth in our utility. Like what can we do for others? Mm. And if we're not doing the right thing and we are rejected and abandoned and humiliated, it is the worst. So we try to overcompensate in every fucking way we can. And that's been, for me, that's been my, my story in so many ways, whether it's make more money, achieve more status, be with more beautiful women, um, be a great athlete, whatever it was, whatever could get me attention. And in the back of my mind, I was having this conversation today with a friend. In the back of my mind, I was thinking, I would actually say, and it would be conscious when I was particularly older in my late teens and 20s, I've got to tell my dad about this. Maybe he'll he'll really like this. Mm. And I didn't make that connection back then of what was really happening, but I was doing all of this for him. And it didn't look like it, but it was. And that now the father wound and the mother wound, they're not, formal psychological terms, but they are reflective of some personality traits and behavioral traits that play out in our lives, particularly in intimate relationships, how we give and receive love. And I gave love to always get something back and to feel whole and full, but it was never, ever enough, ever. Mm. Yeah, and, and I think one of the other wounding and challenging things is, for me, I had to adopt one of two premises. One, there was a just world. And in the just world, this person that I loved would love me at least more than these other people that were treating them like shit, right? Like I would witness what they were doing and witness what I could offer. And it did not make any sense to me. So then there's, if it's a just world, then it's a problem with me. So it was something that was bad with me. Well, I guess I'm not good looking enough. I guess I'm not cool enough. I guess I need to do more or something mm -hmm. or Shame cycle. I don't know what it's got to be wrong with me. Or then, or you adopt another really traumatic and damaging thing, which is the world is just fucked. Mm. It's not me, but this situation is fucked. And, and what women are choosing is fucked. And so there's anger projected out externally at the world or at the feminine. Mm -hmm. So there was really only, and there is a third, the third which path. Is both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there is the third path. But like for me, it was like, it was, I was constantly toggling between those two. Mm. It was like, oh yeah, it's all, it's me, you know, even look, I mean, this pattern, this pattern continued up even to the start of my relationship with Vailana, you know, where I had expressed my love and she wasn't interested and I would toggle between, well, you know what? The world's just fucked. And also, 
well, maybe I'm, you know, my skin color is just a little too medium. Maybe I need to be a lot whiter or a lot darker. And if caramel's just not her flavor, and I guess I'm just unattractive to her. And or I don't know. And I would just sit down and be like, I don't know. But I would still, it was still like in that thing where I couldn't escape. I couldn't like I couldn't actually see the truth because I think the pain bodies were so present and the pain of the unju- like I just steered myself all too often into one of those categories which was internally traumatized. Yep. I think the same I'm, same same thing has happened for me with with guys. The ones I like didn't like me back. The ones that were into me wasn't into you. And then it seems like the one that I like, they'd always go for the crazy girl, like the hot mess. And I'm like, but wait a second. I'm <laughs> sane over here. Like I'm doing my work. I just don't get it. Or they say they weren't ready for a relationship and then I'd see a month later they were posting with their new girlfriend and they were all in love. And same thing. Either men are just fucked they're emotionally immature they're not doing their work or something's wrong with me so i think we we all toggle with that and and relationships especially are such the button for that because there's so much at stake Mm -hmm. and when it when it comes to the heart there's there's just a lot at stake and like steph was saying it pushes that it really pushes those inner child buttons the inner child can hide a little bit more in career and other things but when it comes to relationships and intimacy that wounding that we haven't quite gotten to, it it shows up mm. massively. And so the I, I know for me, like getting out of that cycle was number one, working with my anger at the masculine, mm. whatever, whatever that was. But really what was re- being reflected back to me was my own self-worth issues. Mm-hmm. Like my my own and my own not really being solid in my feminine. So I, and you've known me for a while, I'm sure you've seen, well, I, maybe you've seen the change, but I think I, when you first met me, well, let me ask you, when you first met me, <laughs> would you say I was more masculine than I am now? A hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> like no yeah, hesitation. Easily. I mean, you still, you, that too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you still had the access to your feminine nurturing qualities. Yeah. I mean, I would watch you with me and other people and you could drop into a deeply like nurturing motherly aspect, but there was also that very like I've got to handle this shit yep. and do this shit and like take care of this thing and and that was for someone who you know wasn't particularly like that could be very off-putting yes you know to to certain people who weren't extraordinarily confident in their own masculine because your masculine was healthy and intimidating because you were mm-hmm. getting shit done I, I was know? I just wasn't really balancing it out with the feminine because I believe and I think a lot of women do we so we talk about this like it's it's hard for women to drop into our feminine because we think we're going to give up our power and it's hard for men to drop into their mass healthy masculine because they think they're going to give up their freedom mm. and i was scared that if i dialed back on the masculine energy and let the feminine energy lead more and i didn't even know what that meant would i still be successful would i still be able mm. to manage things it felt like a demotion mm. like people would tell me especially dating coaches. They love telling me, you know, too much in your masculine energy. You're going to need a beta man or you're going to have to, you know, be less masculine. And I heard it as I have to demote myself. I have to let go of this part of me that's purposeful and passionate and successful and loves what I do and gets shit done because I didn't understand the power of the feminine. Mm. I didn't understand because I hadn't yet embodied it. And it's still a dance for me. And he's helped a lot because he told me early on in the relationship, there's only going to be one man in the relationship. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, well, <laughs> I guess uh, that's probably going to be you. Uh, I got to own a few things I didn't quite say uh, in integrity. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't, I didn't mean it, it to come out that way, but it did. We were, we were pretty sloppy. We, we, were we pretty, went pretty head to head. Yeah, we were pretty sloppy. Yeah. But I was terrified. You know, he was terrified to lose his freedom and I was terrified to lose my power. Mm. And what I realized about and feminine. Huh? Sorry, but as a result, right? Yeah. You went deeper into that unhealthy masculine. I went deeper into unhealthy yeah. feminine. Yeah. He got super emotional, and I was like, "Who is I this went guy?" Back to, I went therapy. back to early childhood right. stuff. Yeah. Right? Right. And I went Victimhood. into, "Don't make me cuddle in the morning. I can do whatever I want. I have a day to get to." Like that was literally a fight <laughs> about <Literally>. cuddling. <laughs> I was like, "Fuck you! I'm not cuddling. I I have to do this and this and this." <laughs> Uh, but and now, 
<laughs> oh, <laughs> now, I get, I, now I get mad if you get out of bed without touching. Right. <laughs> touching. Yeah, you're without still a bed touching. boss, though. Uh, yeah, yeah, I am. But <laughs> my point is, and I'm curious how it's been for you, Vi, um, that really, because the, the, the feminine has been so misunderstood lately. You know, we've lost touch with the true power of the feminine. But when I really started to study what the feminine is and like we give birth, not just to babies, but to so many things like like the power of the universe <laughs> resides within us. And this isn't a better than or less than thing. It's just really appreciating the differences. And I have learned that that feminine energy has made me more powerful from an empowered place. Mm -hmm. I get more done without being depleted. Mm -hmm. And this is why I think so many women autoimmune disorders and adrenal fatigue and thyroid this and that mm. like so many women are suffering from these things that are just so based on us pushing and pushing and adapting to a more masculine world and i my I, my hope and my intention is to help when women realize coming into our feminine power is not a demotion mm -mm. at all and it's it's powerful in a different way yeah and we can be even more of who we are when we let go a lot of a lot of that adaptive masculine behavior for sure mm -hmm. yeah i think um i mean for for me i've been very much in my feminine for a long time thankfully i i had a relationship when i was in my mid-20s that invited me to really reflect on myself and how I feel and how I respond to things. It made me deeply intimate with my emotions. And so I've I've probably been so strong on the feminine that my masculine's kind of just been like, boundaries, you know, I don't know what those are. I'm just gonna be passive and always give my power away. I was like totally the opposite end of the spectrum where my coping mechanism was people pleasing to feel love, you know? And and I I had been through you know, relationship after relationship after relationship after relationship where I felt very strongly in my feminine, but I was so passive that there was always betrayal and another woman. And, you know, my wound of not being chosen arose in every single one of them. Um, but it got so strong, my feminine, where, you know, a former partner of mine made a bet with me if I didn't cry for a month straight that something would happen. Cause it was just, it was so consistent for me to anything, to other people's emotions, to my emotions, to challenge, to movies. I was just like this, you know, emotional mess all the time because I think in my earlier life, I had become so good at suppressing my emotions and being the tough girl, being the girl that could keep up with the masculine and just not ever really allowing myself to ever feel anything. So when I actually did allow myself to, it was, you know, it was intense. Years and, and years of tears. Yeah. Of, so just like the tiniest little things that would happen, you know, I'd be inconsolable. And then, you know, fast forwarding to now in the stability of our relationship that I feel the most safe that I ever have in my life, there's such a healthy integration of both. You know, mm -hmm. I, I definitely can't say that I sit directly in the middle. I, I, I have some aspects of my own masculine to continue to expand and, and, and work on and, and deepen into, but my feminine feels very empowered. Healthy, I feel like yeah. I sit in the seat of, I'm so connected with my intuition. Mm -hmm. I'm so connected with receiving energetically from partnership from you know the universe from friendships from other people and my emotions are just you know they just are mm -hmm. it's never something that i'm judging they are always signaling something to me it's just i i feel more like i'm the ocean you know i'm not like crazy storms all the time i'm just flowing with you know whatever's happening all the time but it's been a process of you know deeply knowing myself and and what the masculine and feminine means to me and and how um and the recognition that those exist within all of us yeah you know do, do you feel can I ask you two questions yeah for sure first one is what makes you feel safer than you've ever felt before and the second one is, do you feel, you mentioned about balance in the masculine and feminine, and you said, oh, I'm not quite balanced per se. Do you feel you need to be balanced? Mm, that's a good question, because that's a judgment. 
Um, to answer your first question, the reason I feel so safe is the level of devotion that we have in our partnership. Um, and I think it extends beyond you know, just the construct of what marriage means, but it's actually what it symbolizes in the way that, in, in how we relate to each other, you know, because lots of people get married and just because it, there's some kind of title or a way that, you know, they, they, whatever they think it's supposed to mean, it doesn't necessarily, if you're not really doing the work with your partner, that sense of stability might not really be there. So it's, it's more so in the, in the way that I feel with him, I feel immensely safe and i've had all the contrast of other relationships where i've never felt safe you know until coming to this one that has never been a reality for me so i know you know i know the difference i know and I, I know the feeling and then the, the to answer your second question i don't really know that it is i think actually that you, now that you're pointing it out i think that's just a judgment believing that it's something that needs to be in balance or absolutely center. Um, I definitely think that there there are parts of my um, masculine in in taking action to you know hold space for the feminine that is in me that I would love to work on, but does it need to be in perfect balance? Probably mm. not. I think that's just a judgment. Mm. I think the balance comes in the relationship, in the, the energy, in, right? the, in the energy. Yeah. So I wonder if other, otherwise we're we're walking around in this emotional, emotionally androgynous place that then diffuses sexual polarity for sure. So to speak. There's also a there's also a beauty in, you know, his healthy masculine is mm. so strong and we're so present with each other on a daily mm -hmm. basis, so so present mm -hmm. and deep with each other that, you know, that energy is definitely feels like it's a if you think of us as a as a union and a unit, like that is very much an aspect of me. And he's incredibly, um, incredibly wonderful at at supporting me in taking more action <laughs> I think you're talking about polarity and i think this is an, in union i think this is a, a cool topic to get into and a couple of things just from my own experiences and relationships and ultimately where i think we can guide the conversation is now some practical tips for yeah. union practical tips for self-healing and examples from relationships on how that can work i remember when you know i had i had a former partner and i'll leave all the names out just uh, even though i'm pretty open with everything but i'll leave all the names out former partner very inner feminine and that was great because it allowed me to be very in my masculine. And so it worked. However, I was in the process of building an empire. I wanted to build an empire. And so having someone that was in her feminine, but not in like the, you know, using her divine intuition to help me build the, you know, was it, was, it was kind of like, mm -hmm. yeah, it was kind of like a, a muse for sure. And also the kind of like the wild feminine that mm -hmm. was, you know, tumultuous. It, it seemed like I, 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 this isn't the right, I, I need someone who's, I has enough masculine that can help me build this, that can hold, watch this aspect of the empire while I'm focusing on this one. Like I need someone who can access her king energy mm -hmm. and that wasn't available. So I was like, this isn't working for where I'm going in my life. I need someone with at least a little bit more king energy. Next partner, way more king energy, <laughs> you know? And then so much so that, so much of that masculine energy that I had to, then actually be in my feminine a lot and hold the feminine, which is an uncomfortable place for me for us to have polarity or be in the hyper masculine. So like I had to create, I had to create space because there has to be space for there to be attraction. If you're the same, it's just, it just fizzles, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So I could be really in my feminine and light all the candles in the bath and give like a, a luxurious massage and be like mm -hmm. the, in that super soft feminine nurturing. And that felt pretty good actually, even though it was not a place where I wanted to stay all the time. Or I had to be like, fucking raging bull terminator commando arnold schwarzenegger <laughs> rambo all in one like chuck liddell raising his arms like a conquering hero so to be that masculine and then there was polarity in that so and that was ultimately you know that was ultimately uh, a challenge as well so finding someone that you know by you sit kind of naturally skewed towards the feminine 
just as I'm naturally skewed towards the masculine. Mm-hmm. So let's say I'm 60 masculine, 40 feminine, in my nat- in my most natural. Now that 40 can become 100, or that 60 can become 100. Sure. But mm-hmm. my natural propensity is to be at that maybe 60, 40 call. You can't put numbers to it. And you're kind of you know flip-flopped in that, in a way. So it fits in this like really beautiful way that's really comfortable where i'm comfortably in my masculine most of the time you're comfortably in your feminine and while we can cross over and do it you know we don't have to Mm -hmm. and i think that to me as far as like practical guidance for Mm -hmm. union is finding someone that you don't have to work to get into polarity because i'm not comfortable being at that blistering barbarian 100 Mm percent masculine i'm also not comfortable being at you know my 90 percent feminine i mean i'll i'll go there i can touch the i can touch the extremes but to, to reside there it's too much work yeah and it doesn't really work so that would be i guess some of my practical advice for finding that the polar match yeah well i don't think we didn't fit together that well in our balances in the beginning no yeah no there was something we spoke about this earlier there was something greater at, at play for us because we yeah. didn't fit very well Mm-mm. in those balances because I had to do what you were doing. I either had to be in my hyper feminine or my hyper masculine, mm-hmm. and I can touch. I've got range, and I pride myself on range. It's something I'm very deliberate about, but I don't always want to be there. I want to be where I'm natural, mm-hmm. and Christine would want to be where she's natural because that's homeostasis. That's what yep. every living organism strives for. Mm-hmm. But we weren't, but there was something greater. There was a greater force. I think this is part yeah. of what represents sacred union, right? Yeah. This greater force at play that's unknown. It's fucking mysterious. I don't know what it was. I don't know what it is. Something just pulled us together. I mean, for us to meet on opposite sides of the world, for us to have to legally get married after two months of knowing each other. And so we were legally <laughs> married before the shit really hit the fan. And then it was like, well, there's no We literally had out. the conversation. Or we literally <laughs> said if we were married, I'd be back in Australia yeah. right now. Like, this is not happening. Yeah, because we were really bumping. I think we were both hanging on to old ways of being. Mm. And I, especially for being single for so long, I was scared to let go of that mask because I had used my masculine energy to protect myself. Mm -hmm. Like it had been my guardian in so many ways. And so I, I think I was scared to give that up. And it was also navigating, you know, creating polarity where he came into my world he didn't know anyone. He didn't have friends here. He was building his business and I was in a much different place. So navigating all of that was, you know, it, it was difficult. And so practically some tools, like we got outside support because there, I think we came into the relationship a little personal growth arrogant. Spiritually Like arrogant. a little spiritually arrogant. Like we've done so much work. This is going to be easy. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> and then it was like, it's not fucking easy. <laughs> <laughs> so that outside support uh, was, that was, was <laughs> hey. No, no, about me. I mean, I've done the work. What oh, I don't need to oh, do yeah, anymore. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sure. What do you mean, hey? Yeah, I thought you were talking about it wasn't easy. <laughs> no, no. It's good. It's a lot. It's no, it's now, super. Darling. It's very easy now. Challenges, um, yes, but uh, and, difficult, no. And you know, especially for people that are starting the relationship, I would advise get outside support early because mm-hmm. you're laying foundations, you're laying patterns. We were very lucky to get some outside support early to not get into bad habits. To like, but it has to be good outside support. Yeah, it has to be good outside because support. Because the yeah. thing, I've, ta- I've seen a lot of fucking shit outside support yeah. and talked to a lot of people and, you know, especially listening in on Whitney's calls too because she talks yeah. to people. Yeah. And so many people have such bad ideas that they're propagating and such bad advice Mm. that they're giving people like keeping people in situations that clearly don't work and just collecting that you know consulting paycheck or whatever the fuck they're they're getting from that there's like so many self-serving biases and also misnomers and personal projections like outside help absolutely but you Mm -hmm. better make sure it's good it's going to do yeah if it's not bringing you closer or getting you to clarity then find someone else it's not working Mm -hmm. and that outside support can look like programs it can look like books you're reading together it can look Mm -hmm. like listening to something like this there's there's lots of ways to do that because you have your blind spots in in relationships and then for for us you know we've done we do certain things like in arguments like when we know we're in a loop Mm. with something we and this helps keep the polarity because basically our old pattern was we get into arguments i'd either collapse into my wounded feminine or go into my overbearing masculine and he'd do usually 
I get pretty ethnic, in other yeah, words. So I just get, shout and scream and get yeah. very Greek Italian and loud and yeah, ethnic. aggressive. And <laughs> yeah, and I'm like raised in a German Catholic home. We just hold all our feelings inside. So <laughs> same. Uh, yeah. So, um, so pattern interrupts. Like when we get into a pretty nasty argument, he'd do this thing where he'd we were just in a loop. I'd either ask him to do it or he'd do it. He'd lay on his back and put his feet over his head like he was going to do a shoulder stand and just have his butt up in the air and would have to talk to me from that position. If wow. I really wanted to get funny, I'd pull my pants. Yeah. So she'd see wow. Because <laughs> yeah. when yeah. your butthole's straight up, in the sky, <laughs> you're, laugh, you're not doing like, much but laughing yeah. or being repulsed. So one of the two. Yeah. It would, it, but state it, change. It, it was a state change. Big and time. it broke because that's what I think so many couples, you get in the same argument, you get mm. in a loop, you get in a cycle, and you need to have ways to to get out of it so yeah. that you can actually change the perspective you're having the conversation from. And, and to put some research behind that, I know you'll continue, but the Gottman Institute speaks, and they've done, I mean, they're, they're amazing. If you haven't heard of them, the Gottman Institute is all about relationships. But there's what they've tested that works is to break the patterns. If you're caught in that loop, both of you go for a walk at least 40 minutes. Mm. So you're releasing some endorphins and dopamine and all of that. On that walk, either be blank, just pay, pay attention to where you mm -hmm. are. Don't think about the argument or what you're going to say or how you're going to do it. Listen to an audio book that's completely irrelevant. Come back and read a book or a magazine, something really light, nothing intense, no personal development or anything like that. Wait at least 60, 70, 80 minutes and then come back together. Mm -hmm. And that has proven to work really well in reconciliation and, just, and yeah. coming from a different place. But if you have any abandonment triggers, you have to have agreements that yes. like I'm leaving for a walk for an hour and I yeah. will be back because anyone with that abandonment button is going to yeah. be triggered, which brings me to the next thing I wanted to bring or up. Or the former thing, which yeah. is take your pants off and put right. your butthole oh to the sky. Right, right. Because he usually right kept his pants on. They got big abandonment issues. It's all there. Yeah. <laughs> usually the pants stayed on. Like, um, yeah, that every can, now and then, it depends how bad it got. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that can be a huge source of conflict that I experienced in a prior relationship, with, like talking about attachment styles. Yeah. I definitely have... I have the, the deep need to take some space to myself to understand... Um, to just understand what I'm actually feeling, to come from a place where I can consciously have a conversation with someone, to not be reactive. I also do the total shutdown mm -hmm. and like numb out and I get very monotone and I'm just kind of like, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, taking that space for me was important, but for somebody who has the abandonment wound or they have an anxious attachment, yep. their desire is to fix it in the moment. So having those two styles is, can be incredibly incredibly conflicting yeah so the 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 time agreement is you know self it's it's self it's nourishing for both people because you know the more avoidant person is actually getting their needs met and the person that's more anxious doesn't feel like they're just they're they're losing their love they know that they're coming back they know there's going to be a conversation and it's it's a little bit um create well, certainty yeah, yeah. the the I think the two last things I'll say about like the the practical or what's really helped us and what we've seen help couples that we work with is one agreements that you make after the argument's over. So that like we have agreements about what goes or doesn't go in an argument. Like it would really scare me if he hit the wall or something like that. Like and so that's an agreement. Like you can't like hit something because that's gonna really jar me. Like you can wave your hand in the air, but when you hit something and the sound is loud, that triggers my trauma. Like it's um, we have an agreement that you can't like leaving to go for a walk with a clear agreement, but just storming out of the room or leaving the house. Like so we form these agreements about when we're arguing. Healthy, when we're in a healthy, a healthy state. place, right? When we're connected to each other. And we really and this is this sounds counterintuitive to polarity and great sex, but knowing your partner's inner child wounding, like knowing their attachment yeah. style, knowing their wounding, so helps with arguments and then also helps with polarity because I know, since I know his wounding and he's been vulnerable with me about what really hurts him and because he has the awareness of when we get in an argument, he's self-reflective and is like, this is what this is triggering in me. Mm -hmm. And we have the conversations about, this is what this is triggering in me versus this is what you're doing that's exactly. triggering me massive taking ownership taking that kind of ownership and and also like fighting fair since he knows my wounding and i know his there's certain things i i won't do in an argument or disagreement because i know that's just going to make his little boy mm -hmm. feel rotten and ashamed 
and shut down. And he knows the same for me. The and more you do that, and the more I do that for you, we do that for each other, the more trust and intimacy we build yes. with each other. And that be, and it becomes easier to be more vulnerable and easier to be more open and very real with each other as opposed to hiding and shutting down. And mm -hmm. because the little boy and little girl feel safe inside and they're not like- They're ready to party. The, the, well, they're ready to just be, <laughs> be at rest. And then the, the adult self, the sexual yeah. side's <laughs> like, all right, like things are good. Like I'm not triggered right now, like game on. <laughs> and so it-, it, it helps build that passion in there, a relationship. There's some truth to that. Like a, mm -hmm. a way to, uh, I think not just a woman's sex, but to everyone's sex is through their heart and through yeah. feeling safe. A way, you know, when your heart's open, your your sex is open. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's that's a big, and so it, it, it it's also, I want to say an incentive, but it, it, well, it is, and it's an inspiration for me to continually work on how can I be this safe beacon of truth for you mm -hmm. whilst also honoring myself and that's the balance point and that's my growth edge too so how do I do both is it possible let me explore it let me be really curious about that and the result generally is this massive openness between us mm -hmm. yeah I think one of the things that really came to my attention in a, in a little tiff that Vi and I got in recently is it could have been really really short-circuited and circumvented if Instead of, because both Vi and I have a have a streak of perfectionism, we don't like to be wrong. So I can't we, relate to that. We no. like to be we like to be the one that's right, and so we'll both, you know, we'll both we can lock horns in this way of like using all, and we're very smart and spiritually adept. So we'll be trying to describe what someone says, and well, that's you know, don't tell me that that that's what I did. What are you know, like so we'll start using all the language and all the tips, and then we'll use all of our spiritual tools to actually lock horns, and we're being like fucking spiritual manipulative lawyers <laughs> with each other, like trying to prove that we're right. But like ultimately, the resolution is like, you know, what what do you need right now? Yeah. You know, what do you need right now? And it would have been like, oh, okay, well, I need to be heard or I need, you know, I feel like I need an apology and maybe needs not the right word, but what do you want right now? Like, what is it, what is it that you're, what is it you're asking for with your, with your emotions? Mm -hmm. And, and then it's like, well, maybe you need to be heard. Maybe you, you want to, you want an apology. You want an acknowledgement of what it was. You want a modification of an agreement going forward, a deeper understanding of self. And you start to lay out what you actually want. You're like, okay, like, let's go through all this stuff. But it's so easy to get immediately triggered into, whether you're right or wrong. And then it's our own shame, it's our own perfectionism, our own desire not to be the one that hurts somebody yeah. and not to have that be our fault. Because if you really love somebody, one of the hardest things to deal with is that you hurt them. Yeah. Mm. And so if you can say, no, no, I didn't hurt you, you hurt yourself. you know, And then that mm. becomes like a way that we can be exculpable from our own guilt and we can get locked in that and it could extend something that could have been over in 10 minutes into 10 mm -hmm. hours, you know, rather than just like, all right, so something's activated here. I, I clearly activated it intentionally or not, and let's see how we can resolve this. It's hard to do in the moment, but if we can, I really feel like that that moment because we we blew this trivial thing up, which could have been <laughs> ten minutes into literally ten hours, mm -hmm. you know. And she did take a nice long walk. You know, it was like a six hour walk. I spent time out on the land. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but that and, and it ultimately didn't really even resolve until we're back until we could actually talk through it but i think ultimate that was the final conclusion like how could we have actually circumvented that yep. and it had just been that understanding of what the person who is initially triggered like what they what they need what they're what are they really looking for yeah in mm -hmm. this situation it was a surrendering to that right? there's yeah. a and, and surrendering is in resignation surrendering is i'm going to be open to a different reality uh, as opposed to what I'm attached to and what mm -hmm. I think needs to happen in order to feel better because I'm trying to mask my wounds or my shadows or my pain, my own pains. And, you know, in those moments of vulnerability, we don't want to be wrong. We don't want to show our pain. We don't want to wear our heart on our sleeve because there's a risk of further rejection. That person's already amped up in front of us. They're already angry. They're already upset. And once all the dust settles, you know, and you said this a moment ago, ultimately we just want to be seen, accepted, respected, appreciated, heard, understood. Mm -hmm. that we really just want that. And we can give that to each other. I know that you're amazing at this and I will really give you this. You do this so well. You, you forgive and release. You feel forgive and release mm -hmm. so quickly and you just, you just, uh, what, what's the word? You just fall into this. You allow yourself to fall into this space that says, yep, I thank you for that. That's all I needed. I'm good to go. I'm done. Mm -hmm. But that's because you own. 
Yeah. You, sure. Oh. There, there's a dance there. There's a dance. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Of, of course. Yeah. You know, it's in, uh, John Gottman, who is one of our teachers on relationship and marriage um, and studies relationships and can tell within the first 10 minutes of meeting a couple if they're going to last or not. He talks about- That's a lot of pressure. I know. I know. I'd, be, <laughs> I'd be so nervous. I'd blow like, it. I was like, we're doomed. Do <laughs> oh, yeah. um, but he There's says- masks be on. You don't measure the su success of a relationship or its longevity or its health on how often a couple argues. You measure it more on how quickly they can repair. Mm. Not forget about it and brush it under the rug, but repair the argument, mm -hmm. learn from it, make agreements, get to that place of- owning and, and forgiveness. And that I would that was such a relief to me when I heard it because I think I had in my head that, you know, you're not supposed to fight. Mm. You know, I knew that you that it's normal, but especially in a conscious relationship, you, you know, you should not be fighting a lot. And we'd have these knockdown drag out fights and I'd be like, oh. But what I've seen is, and especially the longer we've been together, one, we don't have a lot of the same arguments and two, we repair so much quicker. Mm. And and so I think that's an important thing for all of us to keep in mind. Like, don't be afraid of the arguments because they're going to come. Yeah. And it's how you grow. You know, you don't just evolve a relationship through great sex and all intimate conversations and gazing into each other's eyes. You you heal and grow in a relationship through the arguments because mm -hmm. that's when the stuff's bumping up against each yeah, other. How that's you deal with you, those? Yeah, that's when you have the arguments. ability to choose something different. Yeah. Yep. And to show your own evolution. Yep. There's a uh, looking back at past relationships that was. <clears throat> absolutely the thing and, and just as steph honor christine i want to honor you as well one of the beautiful things is when you can get back to a zero state where you know there's no harboring resentment and there's not going to be something that's brought up from the past like you know remember that time in tahoe when you you know like just like, like and all of these things just keep getting resurfaced because it's not ever actually worked through it's and all. you get back to like a full zero state where you're not harboring so much stuff from the past emotionally and, and you feel it and i think that's such a it's so nice to know that that's ultimately where we're going to arrive you know because it just it sets my nervous system at ease in such a great way mm -hmm. and i remember you know with past paramours i had one that was particularly tempestuous and would throw up this massive fit you know and just massive like chaotic fit but quickly as the storm would come the storm would pass and there would be no residuals mm. you know like it would be like and the tears come and then now it's over and in a lot of ways that was like way healthier than the mild bickering passive aggressive we never really quite resolved this and i'm like yeah. you sure you're okay yeah little I'm fine. digs here and there yeah, I'm yeah. Fine. yeah no it's good we're good like but i i don't really know that we are you know and so it was way less dramatic and way less tempestuous but like we would never get back to zero and so slowly over time shit would mm. stack Builds. and mm -hmm. there would just be this giant stack and they would say let me go to article b from yeah. 19 <laughs> uh, you know from 2016 and i see here yeah. that i'm still holding this grievance what do you have to say about this <laughs> yeah. i love that it has a british accent too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's oh. where like the um <clears throat> Something that I found so healthy and, and to just touch on something that you shared is if you are if you have the emotional competence enough to feel into yourself, to take a moment to breathe and to come forward in the conversation with ownership. It invites the entire entire conversation to no longer be about blame or trying mm -hmm. to be right. It's like even if, you know, there's still things you're holding on to, I can see where, you know how I said this must have come off in a, in a certain way and I can definitely do better there. You, as soon as you start, as soon as one person starts taking ownership, the entire energy of the conversation shifts. Sometimes that's really difficult to do. Sometimes the, the energy is a little bit too heightened in some sort of pattern interrupt like taking your pants off and doing yoga poses mm -hmm. or, you know, whatever it might be. Maybe that's necessary, <laughs> but, you know, to be a self-resource. I think it's advised. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Start a trend. Try it, try it until it doesn't work. <laughs> Let's just say that. We barely have to use it anymore. Yeah. Yeah. It broke us out of a cycle. I can't remember the last time I broke us out of a cycle. Yeah. yeah. I don't think I've used it this year. We're yeah. for so sure that's the key to next. success. Yeah. Everybody yeah. naked <laughs> yoga poses. Naked yeah. yoga poses. Well, but yeah, the 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 ownership piece, and it's actually um, in my own experience of it, it feels soothing to me because if I'm owning my part in it, 
it's it's like all of my walls are coming down and what I really desire in those you know moments that are conflicting is intimacy. What I really want is to be close. What I really want is to be on the same team and to yes. and to love and bridge that gap of separation that got created through a trigger. And so like the that first step of of, of taking ownership piece has been huge for me and s- just so easy to just calm things down mm-hmm. for a moment to actually have conscious communication. Yeah, I think that's huge. Remembering that you both want the same thing. Mm-hmm. And I, I think our partners will definitely give us the opportunity to exercise muscles we need to exercise. Like for example, in our dynamic, you know, we've established Greek Italian, fiery, and (laughs) I can sometimes collapse in that. So I won't be the person that fights back. Like I'll tend to, well, I used to tend to just kind of hold it inside put in article A, section B. <laughs> um, we refer to this yeah, later. <laughs> yes. But just just collapse and go more into that victim role because mm-hmm. I don't have that fighter, yeller energy in me. And so a lot of times when he'd be in that dynamic, i just collapse and I my little girl would get triggered and it'd kind of go into a pouty mm-hmm. energy. And what I've learned is like him having that in him gives me an opportunity to exercise my empowerment. And, and really speaking my truth. And so now if that happens and it's happening more rarely because I'm you know doing my end, when he does that, I'm like, this isn't what we do. This isn't the kind of relationship we have. We're not going in this direction. Mm. And I stand there in my healthy feminine, like, uh-uh. Because by collapsing, I wasn't calling him forward or no, myself no, forward. I, I, I was staying in extremes. Yeah, absolutely. The, 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 the call forward for me was to move out of extremes because I don't want to overpower someone that is being patty. It's like a, a thug walking up to a, an 80 year old woman on the street or an 80 year old man on the street and just punching them from behind. It's like that type of energy, you know, it's mm. like, there's no satisfaction in that. There's no, there's no equity or equality in that. But what it did do was call me forward out of my extreme ways and to actually stop and listen because my upbringing was very volatile and violent. And that was my conditioning. It's either extreme or it's, it's either really hold back, be passive, be meek, hide from the world or be super fucking aggressive and fight really hard and make yourself really big. And that pattern played out in intimate relationships. I didn't want to do, I wanted, I didn't want to do that with Christine. So when she started stepping into her healthy expression, it gave me an opportunity to see myself differently and actually Mm. choose like almost like a meta analysis and actually choose, do I really want to be this? Is this this the type of person, the man I want to be? Like, What does this even mean? Mm -hmm. And that coming into a healthy conversation and resolution and and connection, intimacy, like what you mentioned earlier, Vi, can actually be attained and felt and embodied. That that's that's special. And that's part of sacred union, like helping each other heal your past but you're calling each other forward into the future and the vision that you want to create together that isn't based on your old dynamics. Because, you know, David Data talks about the different stages of relationships. Mm -hmm. And if you really want to get to what he calls stage three relationship, you're no longer in this just bouncing off each other's past and in the dynamics that your parents maybe had and you're you're evolving into something new so it's it's calling each other forward into sometimes the unknown but into often like what yeah. you know what you want to evolve into and that's a that's an exciting part a tough part sometimes but an exciting part and you've been really great with that with me too yeah, yeah. In, but in doing so, I'm noticing that we're both healing generational trauma. Yeah. Mm. And it's that generational and childhood trauma that impacts us and keeps us in a loop of behaving a particular way. When Because, you know, our brains are pattern recognizing machines. And w- with respect to trauma bonding and trauma responses, we want to keep ourselves safe. We're going to push away anything that feels unsafe or, or replicates or resembles anything that was once unsafe or that was very traumatic for us. But we get stuck in those cycles and they, those it, it deeply embeds in the grooves of our brain. It becomes our norm. And I can almost sometimes feel my brain changing when I'm doing things differently. And I know that's probably mm. me just being, I don't know, poetic about it. But it, mm. it, it, I feel different in my physiology because the, the, the I feel the hormonal release change when we do something that's been very different to how I've done it in the past. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and there's there's no doubt that I mean there's lots of studies I talked about on my podcast with Wim Hof. You know, there's lots of studies that show that generational trauma through epigenetic yep. transfer is a real thing. Yeah. And these patterns, yep. like it's not just your skin color and your hair color and your eye color and these passive and active like basic genes. There's the epigenetic triggers that 
also transmit, you know, uh, and there's a lot of really good research about that. And we mm. do have the opportunity to switch those triggers and so that we don't pass the anymore. We can't do anything about our hair color gene, you know, not yet. I mean, I don't know, maybe we'll talk to Dispenza about that, but who cares? <laughs> but like those other triggers that really count the most, you know, we can, we can shift. And speaking of shifting, I want to shift gears for a minute and talk about sexuality in, you know, in a sacred union and in a relationship. Because I think one of the things, this is a sensitive issue, because as we started, you know, there is a lot of sexual trauma, a lot of sexual trauma in relation, in both men and women individually. So, you know, we're barreling into sex, not really knowing what's driving us in a lot of ways, not really knowing what's there. And then things are evolving and the evolution of those things evolving is also can also be confusing as well well i thought you were into that well i was for a little while and so you know like for example there was you know in a previous partner she was very much slut shamed her whole life everybody projecting that oh you slut you slut you slut so when we first got together she liked being called a slut it was erotic for her she got to claim that and be like in that and be wild in that expression of being that and that was something that was like, wow, this feels really freeing. I feel like liberated and empowered in that. And then like at a certain point, it was like, yeah, don't call me that anymore. Mm. I was like, well, what happened? <laughs> and I was, but, but we didn't have the understanding at that point. Yeah. You know, it'd be like, oh, well, I just healed that thing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. So like this isn't, this isn't what's needed. And, and so sex is this interesting playground where if we're sensitive and we're honoring, you know, we can use... Like we can use like the container to actually move forward and advance and heal rather than pattern trauma. Even if even if the behavior is a little wild or even if it is, it's not about what you're doing. It's about why you're doing it okay. and how you're doing it and whether you're listening to the person to do it. Because like that's, I think, the big key thing to understand. It's not like you can only have sex this one way and it yeah. always has to be with a 30 minute massage. And it, always, <laughs> it always has to be like, no, no, no. But it has to be with consciousness and awareness of self and an understanding of what's going to release a pattern and also what's going to actually compound a negative pattern. Yeah. I, I think so many of us that have had any kind of sexual trauma really disconnect during sex and don't even realize that we're doing it and it becomes more performance um, than it does actually actually being satisfying, like on all levels. Maybe on sort of a physical level it can be, but really satisfying on that emotional level and feeling connected to the other person. Because that's one of the coping strategies for sexual abuse is you just leave your body. Mm -hmm. You can be there and you can be in the act of sex and it can be something that bonds you to a person, especially if we're, we're craving intimacy, often we'll use sex because we think, well, that's the way to be close to someone. Mm-hmm. If we aren't willing to really take down the walls and have that emotional intimacy, it's like, well, at least I can have sex. But if a part of us really isn't there because there is that abuse and there is that trauma and we're disconnecting, then it almost reinforces the trauma mm-hmm. in, mm-hmm. in certain ways. Mm-hmm. Playing out the same pattern or yeah. disassociating yeah. from the body. Yeah. And the other side to that is if you carry a, a stronger masculine energetic, you'll want to be overpowering in, in sexual interaction and you'll want to dominate. And sometimes you'll want to dominate in a very unhealthy way. You want to take the power to make sure that your power is not taken away as well. And that can be for a man or a woman. It presents itself in different in different yeah. expressions. I think when we're talking about sex in relationships or just in general, having a healthy sexual relationship with ourselves is always the first step. Mm-hmm. Cause again, yeah. we can project that onto another. This person is gonna be my sexual healer. This person is gonna make me feel sexy or validated or enough or whatever. And I know for me, I had to do so much of that sexual healing on uh, for myself and really look at how I disconnected or how I performed or how I used sex to feel close when I wasn't getting the emotional intimacy. Mm. And and also how how often I didn't, ask for what I needed or speak up. And that, you know, like for for that woman you were talking about was like owning that that slut. For me, a big step was like just saying, that doesn't feel good. Like I don't 
I don't like that. Mm. Where there's so many times where I would just kind of be like, well, this feels good to Sweet. other women that Passive. I see in movies, so it should feel good to me. Mm. So yeah. I'll just <laughs> pretend that it feels good, but it doesn't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and so it's just that awareness of like where we go during sex, what we're using sex for, like what wound it's activating, right. what wound it's mm -hmm. trying to to fill. And then in a healthy relationship, it can be something that where a lot of healing transpires because true sexual intimacy, I mean, talk about the, that requires tremendous vulnerability and, and, trust. Tr and trust and surrender, mm -hmm. like especially for the feminine, like a massive surrender. Mm -hmm. And we've all fucked it up. <clears throat> yeah, for sure. Know, like I, uh, I mean, I've definitely been a part of the healing process, and certainly, like you know, Vi, you got me as a more mature and wiser and more <laughs> sentient being than uh, you know my former lovers. But and because there was a lot of a mixed bag, you know, I had my own emasculation issues and my own desire to validate myself mm -hmm. through my sexuality that a lot of people had to deal with. I also had a sweet tender like loving stableness and there everybody was contending with my stuff as i was contending with their stuff and you know overall i think it was a net positive but it was certainly a mixed bag but i certainly learned a lot along that journey and you know it's a hard thing to to look back at situations because you know there's nobody that i was with that i don't still love in some way you know it's hard to look back and be like dang mm. <laughs> like really could have done that one better and uh but you know we do the best we can at the time that we're there and you know sometimes vocalizing that to the person makes sense and sometimes it's just you gotta connect and, and speak that to spirit and just you know give yourself that forgiveness for not acting in the way that you would now yeah back then you yeah. know in those in those containers yeah you know two of our teachers jonathan and heike who we did some sexual somatic work with um one thing that they really teach and that we believe too is that part of healing trauma is experiencing pleasure mm. so a big part of healing sexual trauma is pleasure but pleasure that feels safe is i guess yeah. the best way to put it and so in an intimate relationship and deliberate, and deliberate, deliberate yeah there's an, there's an intentionality that comes with that absolutely and so in an intimate relationship, sometimes in, in the experience of sex or anything intimate physically, emotion can come up. And what I'd say to anyone who's with a partner they feel safe with, like let that emotion come up, feel it, and then allow yourself to move into pleasure. Mm -hmm. Because that's what starts to rewire some of that sexual trauma and helps you start to, because the body so confuses pain and, pain and pleasure sometimes and so to be able to feel whatever's coming up the tears and the memories or the triggers or whatever it is and have your partner hold that space but not necessarily stop pleasure it doesn't have to be the act of sex but something that moves you into pleasure after that so your body can start to feel like okay it's safe for me to receive yeah, pleasure like it's dangerous yeah yeah, yeah. But yeah. pleasure pleasure can be even an, uh, an affirmation or a confirmation from your partner and this is why conscious relating relating with an awareness and in a in a way that is just sacred whatever you deem to be sacred and really important to you can be so beautiful one of the ways that we really release trauma is through loving presence empathetic resonance and radical self-acceptance and when you provide that for your partner and they're seen in their most vulnerable state they're not only physically naked but they're emotionally raw and naked as well there's something profound that happens that you know, we can intellectualize it all we want but until you're in that experience there's that shift that you feel again it's like you're, you feel your brain rewiring you feel in your, your body yeah mm -hmm. you feel your psyche just changing and shifting becoming more malleable it's just this it's a beautifully profound feeling that's that that loving presence it's it's i want to say it's almost everything mm -hmm. yeah so let's uh let's wrap this up with um i want to go through and let's talk about you know the men will talk about the one step for healing you know one piece of advice for healing the inner masculine women you know here you can mm -hmm. talk about one step for healing the inner feminine and then We'll give our, you know, one tip for one idea or concept for, you know, how to bring that 
into union. We'll just allow spirit to move through and allow us to choose one because we're all people who could probably come up with a, a <laughs> listicle of 10 or 12 <laughs> and, uh, and do that. And before we do that, let's go pee. So the things that I would offer in healing the feminine that have been pretty massive for me, one is, you know, part of feminine energy is receiving. And something that I had such a challenge around, I think because I was more in my masculine as a, as a younger woman, is, you know, always feeling like I got it, to, you know, I've got it together. I don't need anything from everyone. I got this. And there's there's something to blocking, you know, abundance, relationships, so many different aspects of life when you're not in a comfortable place of receiving. And just like we saw, you know, at the beginning of the podcast where we were talking about the exercise with the men and women, the women were invited to receive honor and reverence from the masculine. And I'd imagine that for many of them, you know, not only were they experiencing something that they have never received before from the masculine, but how much do they actually allow themselves to receive? I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm positive at least a few people were probably uncomfortable with that sense of, you know, giving love and energy and honor and reverence to them. So something- I had at least eight people come up and tell me that exact thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that it the, was really the, uncomfortable. I just wanted them to stand up because it was too yeah. much for me to receive mm -hmm. that. And it's this weird false, like, hum I think for me, it was like a false humility. Like, you know, I don't, I'm okay. I don't need that. But you're, you're really blocking the energy flow of of allowing somebody else to be the giver and, and be the receiver. And I think that's hugely a feminine aspect. So um, that's definitely something that I would offer that's helped me in my own process. And then the other one is, you know, in moments that you are having pain or challenge, can you treat yourself like the loving, nurturing mother that you wish you had that you didn't have when you were a child? You know, like what would your loving mother do in a situation? Would she tell you to get it together and be quiet? Or do you actually need to be held and tell that it's okay to feel your emotions? Be told that it's okay to break down and go through anything that you're experiencing and know that it's okay, know that it's valid, know that you are loved. Can you, can you be in relationship with yourself in that way and really hold compassion and empathy and forgiveness? <laughs> I'll go uh I'll go next and then leave it to leave it to the the master coaches of our <laughs> of our uh, experience in Sedona and and in life to to bring us home with it but I think for me um and this is really you know a big one for me is I had a lot of criteria about what it meant to be a man which was wrapped up in in the masculine so I thought that the concept of man was inexorable from masculine and to be a man was a very lofty goal and a large list of things that were required. I had to be the strongest, I had to be the best, I had to be, and there was all of these external extrinsic criteria to validate my own manhood. And there is nothing that can validate your manhood that's external. It is an internal thing. Mm -hmm. It is you with you, you know, and so, that actual understanding means that instead of measuring yourself based upon all of these external factors, you just have a deep knowing of self. And then starting to cultivate that and practice that is I think a really key key concept. Like if you wanna cultivate your inner masculine, you know, don't worry about all of the things you need to accumulate in the cars and stuff. Have that if you want, have fun, have a fucking blast. Get whatever you want, do whatever you want, build all the sand castles in the world, know that the sands of time are going to be you know, eroded by the ocean when it comes in and takes away you know, this life and whatever, fine. But build the sand castles and, and love it, enjoy it. However, to really build the masculine within you that, that really counts, you have to focus on the internal practices. And there's so many ways to do that. You know, one of which that's quite simple, I talk about it all the time, is if you want to cultivate the masculine and you see a freezing cold plunge of water and you know that there's going to be benefits from getting in that cold, if you want to cultivate the masculine archetype within you, you have to be the one 
that is willing to say like, oh yeah, that looks cold. I'm going in. And it's not only that you decide to go in, it's how you go in. Are you going to go in gasping and breathing and flailing about? Or are you going to go in like, I'm just going to go in. And I'm going to breathe however much is necessary, but I'm going to slide in. And you're not going to get it right the first time, and you're going to talk yourself out of it 100 times. This isn't about judgment. This isn't about, did I prove that I was a man today? No, you're not proving anything. You're training. You're cultivating that aspect of masculinity every time you go through a process like that. And every time you do that, you'll know a little bit deeper inside that like, yeah, yeah, I have this and I am willing to do this. So when you have to go into something emotionally difficult or go into something spiritually difficult, you'll have the training, you'll be prepared in a much deeper way. So that's the tip that I would encourage everybody to cultivate, you know, that inner masculine and also heal that understanding that says it must be external and it's comparative because it's not none of that shit actually even matters at all they're all just sandcastles and then as far as approaching and stepping into um relationship i think the the most important thing is to be as steady as you can and this is this is really the ideal because the more erratic you are the more unsafe everybody's going to be and this is the hardest thing and this was really hard for me because i would be steady 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 hold it hold it hold it grin and bear it tough it out fuck i can't handle it anymore and then everybody's like ah i don't know when that's coming like when the when is that thing coming like and so everybody's like uh things seem okay but i'm not sure because i don't know if he's holding 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 so steadiness doesn't have to mean that you're actually like homogenous all the time but it's that these you don't you're not repressing and then exploding in a way so that if you're having little blips like hey i'm really mad about that it happens like immediately you know like and then you're like okay okay sorry about that i'm over it so that there's no like anticipation of some big surprising erratic thing because that's going to really erode the safety in the relationship and actually cause the contraction in the feminine so you know if you feel something feel it move through it let it go out you know do all of the strategies to mitigate kind of the harmful aspects of anger anger is very pointy and it's very jagged and it's very easy to cut you know never use names like don't call any names those things stick even after an argument even if voices were a little raised and whatever if there's not that defining word or that defining moment like that punch in the wall all of it just kind of like fades into the whitewash of your memory and you're like yeah we got fucking into it but if there was like that one word you know like well that word's like stuck like stuck in your brain or that one moment or there's that dent in the wall that's there for like the the next week and i've punched my own walls and i've you know i've fallen victim to all these but i think through experience it's sharing immediately in the moment and you know moving through that so there's no as few surprises as possible and then mitigating the damage of you know some of the the harmful aspects of any anger like words or like things that could actually last beyond when the resolution of uh of the issue comes up Mm -hmm. so that's that christine Mm. Mm, so many things for the feminine (laughs) (laughs) i am i'm actually going to speak about discernment because one of the misconceptions i had about feminine energy that turned me off to it a bit is that the feminine is so flowy we can't make a choice and like it's unreliable and although there's definitely flow to feminine energy i think the more accurate thing to say is feminine energy is very adaptive almost to our demise in some ways we can overly adapt but we also have this incredible power of discernment the feminine mm-hmm. is so discerning our intuition is so spot on and i really encourage Uh, my sisters to cultivate that, to cultivate this power of discernment that doesn't come from pro-con lists and it doesn't come from rational thinking. Mm -hmm. That's more the masculine way. It's this inner knowing straight from you to the divine that you just know. You just know in an instant and to trust that because it's very different than the constructs of the mind and the way we talk ourselves in or out of something. Steph says something I love. He says, "The the masculine leaves too early and the feminine stays too long. The unhealthy. The unhealthy. Sorry, <laughs> let me say that again. Roll back. Do it. The, the mass unhealthy masculine leaves too early, mm. and the unhealthy feminine stays too long. Mm. And that's when the un, 
the feminine's not in the power of discernment. You know, mm -hmm. she's staying too long because she's, whether it be a relationship or job or whatever it is in a pattern, because she's not using the power of that discernment. She knows, she knows, but maybe because it doesn't make sense or it's not acceptable or everybody else tells her she should do something differently. She doubts that and moves away from this incredible power of discernment and intuition. So I think as women, as we tap more into that, that power of discernment that leads to our intuition really opening and cultivating, that's where we get all our answers. Mm. And that's when we're able to really lead from that, from that queen. You know, that's in so many ways the archetype of the queen to be able to really discern and be like this way, or this is a yes, or this is a no, and just have that clarity and, and not even need a reason why. It's just like, I just know. Yeah. I just know. I have a really, and I want to lob this out here because I had a I had an interesting download about intuition. Mm. So all the time, like, where does intuition come from? Like, what is it? What is it actually happening? Are we tapping into some collective? Is our does our soul know things? And I think all of this is possible. But I had another hypothesis, and I think all of this is real, actually. But this other hypothesis was really interesting. So there's an actual phenomenon called savant syndrome, and it was depicted in Rain Man. You know, Dustin Hoffman. Mm -hmm. All of the, you know toothpicks or whatever would drop and he would know exactly how many toothpicks fell and this phenomenon maybe not exactly exemplified in the movie but this is a real phenomenon where there's a calculation process that our conscious mind doesn't have access to that is actually happening at all times so in the savant syndrome people are actually able to access that and vocalize what they're actually computing at like a micro level mm. But I believe that we all have that capability. If their brain is doing that without them even thinking about it doing it, our brains are doing that as well. So there's some deeply subconscious aspect of our brain that is making an impossible amount of micro calculations, so many so that our conscious brain couldn't even actually fathom it. Yeah. Mm. And so that's actually guiding our intuition. So it's not some woo-woo mystical thing. This is a, a, a computational aspect of our brain that or, or an adaptability of the the body to feel like if you mm -hmm. think of us as evolved beings how many thousands of years you know have we protected ourselves from death and you know whatever else and that's a that's another aspect and i think that's real that's real as well and i think but for people who have a hard time with this intuition like why would i trust that but if you think about it as like this is actually the most perfect you know analyzing computational aspect of you that's just shrouded because it's happening at such a fast level. It would be like trying to analyze the program code of a computer that spits out an answer mm. like this. You can't see the code, you just know the answer, but the code is happening so fast, you know, at the speed of light as those binary ones and zeros are just flying through your processor. You know, that's maybe one way to look at it. And of course, I do think we're sensitive to energies and wisdom that's beyond just the self. But I thought that was like an interesting way mm -hmm. to look at it. And it's really freed me up to, to really trust my intuition more, perhaps because I am, you know, so in that kind of chess playing <laughs> rational side. I needed that justification, just like science because in some ways is the new, you know, language of spirituality. You know, that's what Joe yeah. Dispenza talks mm -hmm. about all the time. Yeah. Like we gotta give people a little science so they can actually go on this spiritual. Makes it path. comfortable. Yeah. Right. I'd, it makes I'd, it comfortable. I'd add something to that. And mm -hmm. in that in that comfort, we become more open and more receptive. Right. And I add something to that with the nervous system as we clear the clutter of our trauma and our past, because we've all got that, well, at least most of us do. We're maybe not able to make the unconscious conscious, those, those unconscious processes that are happening so fast, but we're able to connect to them in a new way because our nervous system now, the ENS, the enteric nervous system, the brain, the amygdala, all the, all the parts of our body and brain that are literally fighting to protect ourselves and you know the threat funnels that we have that are assessing our environment, they begin to dull down. Mm. And then we're able to access that process of that intuition through the nervous system, through our environment, at faster rates, and we're able to trust that because we're not so fucking busy worrying about staying alive at mm -hmm. this unconscious level. Yeah, yeah, well said. Okay, off to your- So back to discernment. Yeah, to I love that. Yeah. Um, the, the, the toothpick picture gave me a, a picture of what so many women can do, which is walk into a room of people and know exactly what needs to be done. Like mm. you feel mm -hmm. people know who needs what, know mm. who's sick, know who needs, you know, just know what needs to be done. And it's, it's so important for, for the feminine not to doubt herself, because that's something that so many women struggle with. Yeah. Self-doubt, self-worth, just doubting, 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 doubting. Because in, in so many ways too, since we live so far in a little bit more masculine paradigm or a lot more, a lot of what 
the feminine thinks isn't in alignment with a lot of the ways things are going. So it mm. perpetuates self-doubt at, at sort of a collective level, but then on the individual level, because of our own trauma and wounding or whatever it is, we just doubt ourselves so much because mm. often the head and the heart can disagree. So really discernment, know that the feminine isn't this like airy fairy flowy, I'll just wait for a masculine to come on and make my decisions. It's really discerning and that is really powerful. I also and think- attractive. Yeah. yeah, it's super <laughs> sexy. I mean, it's it's all. I mean, that's I when I've experienced it, and I experience it all the time with Vi. It's super sexy, and it's like it's access to ma it's magic. I'm like, <laughs> wow, magic. Yeah, it's real, you know. And that's a uh, that's like a such a such a really powerful thing to be able to like behold and like be able to have, you know. Mm. in in union and, and in anything and cultivate internally and uh and external yeah. and in in partnership as well yeah so trusting ourselves and then i'd say in relationship it's really learning how to be compassionate and be the muse mm. so i think so often women we we have less opportunities to be aggressive we for the most part, don't fight as much, don't hit as much, don't yell as much. I'm making massive generalizations, but there are some fair generalizations to make. And so our weapon is in our judgment. Our weapon is often in the mind. And I see this so much with women in relationship. If they're not getting their needs met, they're not feeling seen, they won't necessarily get aggressive, but they'll get judgy. Mm. They'll get critical. They'll get nitpicky. They'll start collecting evidence for all the things she's doing wrong, all the ways she's not appreciated, so on and so forth. And so that moves us out of the feminine energy of being compassionate and being the muse. And I've learned so much in our dynamic that me trying to coach Steph or judge him or criticize him or tell him how to do it, it's frustrating for us both. And it may move him an inch, but it doesn't last and then he's just resentful and it completely throws off our polarity. But if I can be compassionate for whatever he's going through and be the muse, like call him forward mm -hmm. through my love, through my compassion, through my sexuality, through, again, not being seductive in a manipulative way, but just being that like that muse, that thing that calls him forward, that feels so much better to me, so much more enlivening than the criticism and the judgment and the collecting evidence. So I think that's really an opportunity for the feminine is to move out of that dynamic. You know, you see so much on television shows, just women throwing the men under the bus and men aren't good for anything. And like, you know, I'm it's all up to me. And and let's move out of that that dynamic and that paradigm and again make it more that equitable thing. And for for women, the feminine dynamic that I feel really compelled to step more into is that muse. Mm. rather than the you critic are. yeah you are. Beauti beautifully said i want to pose this to both of you guys because one of the issues with intuition and i've seen this with a lot of female friends and even in our partnership if someone's experienced somebody gaslighting them mm. you know which is basically a woman woman has an intuition there's something fucking going on there and then the man with the puts on his lawyer hat and is just like well i will tell you all the reasons why you're wrong even sometimes knowing that she's right, mm. you know, or or also not wanting to look at the point that she's making or not wanting to agree. So you you get, you know, that's what gaslighting is. It's a it's a term for when somebody makes you feel like you're crazy for mm -hmm. what you're actually believing. And over time, if someone does that, and a lot of times, you know, if you're with a good lawyering type of person, and it could be masculine or feminine, they will have such a they would present such a case that you're like maybe i am fucking totally losing my mind For when you've sure. known that you've been right so it's what so would you shrinking. say you know what would you say and, and it's not that intuition is always right either you know i remember uh i remember a time where i was with a partner and uh this was before my polyamory days and she came over to my house and she was like whose shampoo is that in the shower i was like yours she's like no it's not and then like 20 minutes later He's like, oh yeah, I brought that over from the place. I was like, see, mm. there's nothing there. So it's not to say that every intuition is right. Like sometimes, like, and for everybody, we have to know that our intuition is a guide, but it's not like yeah. you're batting 100. 
Sometimes yeah. it's fear. I, Disguise I, I, I is a, intuition. I've got a question yeah. that's just going to, I think it's going to maybe fuck all of this up. Right. What if intuition is never wrong? And if you're wrong, it's not intuition. That's what I think. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Well said. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well said. Yeah. Question. I, I mean, I, I don't. I think, no, I think, I mean, I think you fucking, yes. I think you fucking <laughs> nailed it. I honestly think you nailed it. So then it's the discernment. Yeah. between whether it's intuition or whether this is a projection of an idea masquerading as intuition just like you can say i'm talking to my soul but it's really your ego who's impersonating your mm. soul rather yeah. than your soul talking yeah. to you which is where it gets really tricky yeah. but i think that's a, a brilliant way to put it yeah. but then to go back to the gaslighting yeah. situation um you know i know vi you've experienced it i'm imagining yes. that you've experienced it as well so what do you say to a person who's in that situation and then how to regain your trust in your own feminine intuition well i know for me it was leaving the situation yeah like, it, it, it like, was get the fuck out. yeah it was <laughs> it was i mean i would literally be in, this was an ex of mine i'd walk in thinking i was wearing a green shirt and walk out thinking my shirt was red i was like mm-hmm. wait a second you know and it it's especially if you're consider yourself an intelligent person it's even more confusing because it's a whole it's a whole head trip so for me and for people that i've worked with it has been leaving getting out of the dynamic being like no no because so much of breaking the cycle of gaslighting is taking our power back yeah and just being like no i i trust my i really trust myself and you can see too when you have the boundary enough to be able to step away for it even if it's something that's temporary mm-hmm. taking some time to just totally break from you know the codependent entanglement it's very very clear yeah like it can become very clear to you how much that's actually taking place when you're constantly in the energy of somebody that's doing that to you and i mean i can i can speak hugely to that just the contrast of being in partnership that is stable and my intuition is really honored you know like there's so much belief in what comes through for me but then to feel all the times where i just knew Mm -hmm. but you know not having the evidence or having the lawyering going on it's like I, i i shrunk and shrunk and shrunk and shrunk and started to just question you know literally am i crazy yeah but it took enough self-love and boundary and like as she said discernment to give myself the ability to just take the space from it yeah so that i could decide for yeah. myself yeah i think that's when tribe and soul family is really Mirrors. important yeah because having other people that can say no violana you are you're correct here like this is you're seeing truth here and having that those kind of mirrors i think is also an important part of supporting someone to get out of that gaslighting Mm -hmm. dynamic and i think for for a man you know to really i remember i had my first experience with a really intuitive woman was not someone we only dated for a very short amount of time saw each other a handful of times we actually took a trip to peru together too well before the peru trips of the modern era but i remember one time we, we were in a room and in a situation and it was i think in vegas actually and uh she told me something and then i was like no and she was like uh, she sensed something with with one of the people in the room and i was like no way and i listed this whole reason all of these reasons why and she's like those are all really good reasons like that's really impressive that you laid that out but i'm right <laughs> And I was like, and I started laughing. I was like, what? Like, did you not? I just laid out the whole case. It's it's logically impeccable. She's like, I know, it was great. Like, you really did a good job. Like, good work. But I'm right. Mm. And then we laughed about it. And I think partly because it was, you know, a trivial situation. There was no mm-hmm. emotional entanglement. I like, I thought it was sexy. And mm-hmm. I was like, this is fun. This was cool. And it turned out, like, weeks later, that absolutely what she was sensing was absolutely true and i was completely wrong and that was the first moment where i was like damn she had access to magic yeah you know she had access to something that i at that point you know i was 27 28 mm-hmm. at that point I, I had i just couldn't i didn't have that access and she just had this purview into it and i was i was always so impressed and i'll never forget that moment and it was a great lesson for me that even though i was logically impeccable i was wrong Obviously, I wasn't logically impeccable, but it seemed that way. And so I've always approached 
you know that that sense of intuition with like i i know that this is possible and i know that there's an access to the the unseen that's available and so just giving the space for that and knowing too that it can be something masquerading as intuition that's not that as well and so if you're a woman don't say like what's my intuition and i know it's right yeah if it's your intuition maybe it is right but it could also be something else masquerading so uh all of those caveats i think it's such an important issue i'm just so glad that you brought that to the forefront mm. so that we could like bat around yeah, yeah, yeah. how to like how to deal with that in in union because i think it is just a super important aspect yeah well i think steph can feel it like he knows when i'm speaking from my intuition because there's not emotion there's not charge to it i just he can he can feel it mm. and and then he can feel when it's a fear when it's and he's like i don't think that's really your intuition i think that's fear mm -hmm. and that's again the beauty of the mirror you start to know i'm sure aubrey can tell like when you're really clear and when you may be triggered and it's like that and you with him as well mm -hmm. and as you get to know each other more not just you two but just people in general then it's like it's useful to have that mirror it's like yeah that's your intuition no that's not that's your ego disguising or your fear disguising mm -hmm. as intuition and also as you know as a as a woman and as a partner you know like a lot of times understanding that my logic and analysis of a situation you know let's say a particular like a health situation yeah you know like my body of knowledge and my expertise is going to have me logically have i will have gone down the path mm -hmm. so supporting me in that if she starts to go through down the path it's like well yes i've already thought of that and the three alternatives that are that and i could go explain all that and maybe that's fine for you know the comfort of the mm -hmm, conversation mm -hmm. but where it gets really interesting is when she just puts her hand on my belly and goes oh yeah this is what's wrong with you and mm. i feel it and then i'm like okay now i got some real information that i couldn't figure out from reading my books yeah. and talking to you know the doctors and yeah. you know figuring this out it's like this is now access to to something else that and i always take that perfectly seriously and it's such a it's such a gift if you're able to tap that and it's not just women who can do that yeah men can do that by accessing their feminine mm -hmm. and i think that's what you were saying steph about consciously expanding your range yes so that you can go into like a deep feminine receiving and access those same things as all as well as your you know vigilant masculine both and i think that's it's the more range we have the better you know balance isn't staying in a narrow band it's just how big can your how yeah, big can your range be? That, that really is the balance for me, and it reminds me of a story around shamanism and what shamans had access to. We live in a world, a contemporary world, where we value so much over everything else, logic and reason. You know, mm. goal attainment, uh, achievement, uh, being an object, an objective driven world, and everything else falls by the wayside. This discernment, this intrinsic knowing, gets lost. But in the ancient days, where shamanism the practice of bringing wholeness into community and society was more palatable more practiced more 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 loved there was this this is outside of the realm of reason hey reason has power it has a place it has it has meaning in our world and the balance point on that on that spectrum of range is this also has meaning let's play in this realm as well we don't do that in 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 the world today and you know if you were to split masculine and feminine and just use contrast dynamics you would say that reason is and logic is is masculine that discernment and intuition is more feminine and because we don't value the feminine energetic or the realms the various realms of the feminine what happens is we put that by the wayside we think it's not good mm -hmm. it doesn't not carry enough, any weight yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. but that's not that's not the truth because this this realm of logic and reason is very valuable and mm -hmm. it really one of the reasons why it carries value is because of the feminine the complementary opposite mm -hmm. we, we've lost touch with, mm -hmm. with that. I, know, I know i know i did for a long time and mm -hmm. think of how think of how valuable that is in a partnership sacred union or any partnership to actually honor that feminine coming through you know like seeing where you might have blind spots because your logical mind is so you know on this path because of everything that it knows but what if you get a different lens into something and then for you tapping into your own feminine that wow that actually feels really right you know it's 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 bringing forward the feminine and within both of us and it's i mean we've we've seen it time and time and again from health issues to you know business stuff i mean we're very deep with each other and we talk 
deeply about a lot of things all day long. And, and I mean, it's, it's just, it's, it's been incredible in our expansion to just his, his trust in, in my feminine and his own feminine that's in agreement with, you know, a lot of the things that come through for me. It's like, it's like modern day magic. Mm. Yeah. We can get so lost in like the logos, you know, the, this is the logos, this is the law, this is, so you think of that scene from Avatar where there's the king and Jake Sully comes in and all of the Avatar people have been just, you know, terrorizing and fucking with their village and they're like, okay, according to our law, we put this, you know, ghost walker to death. And then the the queen, who's the medicine woman of the tribe, she kind of sniffs him, looks around, like gets her intuition and says, no, 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 not this one. Mm-hmm. You know, like this one is something. And then he ends up, you know, saving jumping him. on the giant dragon and saving the, uh, you know, saving the tribe. And But it was that intuition that I think must be blended with the, with the logos. In, in, in the right balance, it's like, it's both. And, you know, of course, I don't know how that would work in the legal system. And it's, you know, there's a lot of issues <laughs> on the large and we're out of the tribe. But in our own union, in mm-hmm. our own thing, yeah. it's like, this is what makes sense according to the logos, but this is what makes sense according to the pathos, according to the emotion and like what the emotional body, and then you then you ultimately have to decide between them. What about masculine for youth? <laughs> Shadow work is imperative for every human being, um, for men in particular. We have repressed big, big emotions, sadness, anger, rage, and... And you may think, well, really? Because so many people see and view the masculine as aggressive, but it's leaky. It's not contextualized. It's not connected to their trauma or their pain. It's not connected to what they've actually experienced that's been so painful that they keep harboring. And that's just like a release valve. That's just letting go of a little steam every Mm. time. And so shadow work and being witnessed by other men is so, so important. And to be in a container where you're able to emotionally release without being shamed for your anger, that's a safe space to do so, whether it's with another man, even on your own at some points, solitude's a real important part of healthy masculine expression. But being witnessed by other men and moving through core trauma, you, you, I love this analogy, I use it all the time. When we were doing that in a child workshop mm. and you use the analogy of the gold chain. Mm-hmm. So you have a thin gold chain and it's in your drawer and you're clearing out your drawer and you see the gold chain, it's got a lot of knots in it and you're trying to do the knots and you usually come to me, Steph, do these knots. I'm like, I don't want to fucking do it. It's too, I can't be really bothered. You know what, it's really tangled <laughs> yeah, and it's all, tangled, all these knots. Like, I don't want to do it, I'm doing something else. I'm in my masculine. Mm-hmm. And, um, but you get to that core knot and then all the other knots just unravel. Mm -hmm. And there's something to be said for that with the emotional pain that we experience. And men don't do their shadow work. They don't have healthy uh, outlets. We have evolved in tribe, in bands of brothers, in in brethren. We are so isolated as men. We, We drive in cubicles or we're stuck in a cubicle, whether it's a train or a bus, we work in cubicles, we come home, we're not happy with ourselves, we compress ourselves. I'm generalizing here and I'm very clear on that. And I think it's a fairly educated generalization. So many people are unhappy in their lives and men don't have that healthy outlet. So shadow work, exploring those unwanted, unmet, the unwanted parts of us and the unmet needs that we have, exploring that baggage that we have, actually being okay with expressing it and releasing it so it doesn't leak out in relationships, it doesn't play out in negative patterns. Men suffer so, in, and we're told, like, you gotta be a man, man the fuck up. Don't, don't express that. Don't be angry. Don't be, but we do end up getting angry. Even, even if those that play sports, contact sports, and they have a great deal of anger and they're able to express that when there's no cognitive or emotional connection or real witnessing that, Hey brother, it's okay that you release this pain and this emotion. It's okay that you let yourself free of that burden. It's okay that you were hurt by your father or your mother or that babysitter raped you or that you were hit by a truck and it still hurts you when you were nine years old and you you can't shake not feeling safe in your body. That's okay. You can let that go. You can feel and experience it and all of you is welcome. We need that as human beings, but men really need that. If we're talking about a union merging together, men need that deep, deep work, that shadow work. And, you know, off the bat of that, with respect to relationship, we have to be willing to go down those paths that are really uncomfortable, that really hurt us and that are painful and let the feminine in our lives witness that as well and see that. See us not taking it out on them or our families or our communities, but being responsible for that, being willing to look at our fears, being willing to look at our pains, our struggles, being willing to have difficult conversations, being willing to step into our truth, being willing to celebrate. 
really celebrate our wins as men. You know, don't, I, I struggled so, and that's receiving. I struggled so much to receive and I would never celebrate my wins. I was always onto the next thing. My beloved grounds me into, wow, you celebrate that. You deserve that. That's amazing. And, and that's a beautiful. I resonate with that. Yeah. <laughs> that's a beautiful reminder for me. Do you realize <laughs> what you did? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure, sweetie. Yeah. I did, of course. Yeah, yeah. Not, no, really. Not, really. Not, really. not really. Not really at all. Not getting it. Uh, not really. Not getting that. And I just think that we need that. And, you know, as, as a tangible tool, you know, f- do your shadow work, be reflective, spend 10 minutes every day at the end of your day and ask. You, you know, we talk about Greek mythology for a moment or Greek Greek philosophy. The the Greeks would say, the ancient Greeks would say, spend some time at the end of every day reflecting on who you've been, who you were with others, how you feel about yourself. What could you have done differently? What could you have done better? What would you want to change? What were you grateful for? Whatever it may be, that reflective praxis is everything. And and let let that be that that centering solitude practice. Let that be nature, connect to earth because we're so disconnected from earth and be in that space of let me receive some wisdom by actually checking in with myself mm. and find support groups, find a coach, find a therapist, find a counselor, find a shaman, a spiritual teacher. Don't do it, do it alone. Like isolation and solitude are very different. Solitude is voluntary because we know there's benefit in being on our own. Isolation is when we hate ourselves. We're in self-loathing and we're fearful mm. and we're hiding from the world. Too many men do that. Mm-hmm. And that fucks relationship. It, des- it, it destroys intimacy and union because we, they're checked out. I was always checked out. And, and even, even then, if I have to be really honest, even now, sometimes I'm checked out with you. If I'm in my stuff and I'm not dealing with it, I'm checked out with her. Like I'm physically there, but I'm not emotionally mm-hmm. there. And that's because I'm not dealing with the thing that I need to deal with that will actually give me freedom, but I'm addicted to staying in it because it's familiar and familiarity is safe. And so in order for us to feel un- to feel safe as men, we have to feel unsafe in a safe environment. I hope that makes sense. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but that's that's what I would say for for that. Yeah, I think you bring up a lot of really important points there. And I think one that practice of the practice of solitude as you said you know i know i remember one time i think it was actually the last podcast we did Mm -hmm. you were talking about you were going on a some wild vision quest where Mm -hmm. you brought like a buckskin and a and a knife (laughs) like a fucking real aussie (laughs) out out there and you're like i'll find some shelter somewhere yeah yeah no tent nothing yeah and uh and like that's it's doing ex- the same thing that i said it's knowing something about yourself it's yeah. learning trusting yourself to be able to go into the void of the unknown and with your own s- essence and your own skills and your own body and knowing that you can survive which i think is important yeah also sitting with yourself i mean i've i talked to so many people who are badasses and i talk to them about my six days in the darkness and they're like get the fuck out of here and they've accomplished like the most incredible things, done ayahuasca journeys, mm-hmm. all this other stuff. But like, hell no, you know. And it's like it's interesting. Like, what do you mean? Like, what are you? What are you afraid mm-hmm. of yourself? Like, what are you going to find in there? You know, like monsters under your bed? No, you're afraid of your mind. Yeah, and that's like oh, the thing. Are. And and unless we're in the solitude without any distractions, you know, we'll we won't ever see what monsters are under the bed. So we'll always be running. Yep. We'll always be we'll always be diving and not letting our foot dangle because we're worried that something's going to grab at us so that point i think is really a great point and um the other point is just the rites of passage with your brothers in general right now yeah. what do we do what do we do when we get together with the boys drink you know or unless we're playing like pickup ball or you know golf which involves drinking there's like very few activities yeah. that don't involve intoxication which fine i, I drink too like it's not like i'm a against that aspect but you got to do other stuff too well there's no substance in our modern day rites of passage exactly the ancients those bonding rituals are not there where you're like going through some real shit and like being vulnerable and stepping into that with your brothers man it's fucking powerful yep Mm -hmm. it's like everything it, it cannot be it cannot be understated and i to be honest i had some resistance to like quote men's work i was like ah nah you know like i'm doing the work and we can mix it up you know what does it matter but then i started having men's groups out in sedona where it was just men mm-hmm. and it's it's a different thing it is a yeah. different thing when there's not a single woman around like one woman in the dynamic changes everything maybe for the better but but it changes <laughs> everything and like whatever whatever happens there in the men's group 
it's just radically different when it's just men yeah. and there's something really beautiful to that and so just grateful that you're not only doing the work individually but offering that because mm. it's so needed and uh, and i think until you experience it you don't even recognize how mm. needed that it is mm. yeah yeah well all right this is a long one and a good one. I'm fired up. I could keep <laughs> yeah, going. I know, we can no, keep I'm, going. I'm going. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. I'm in now. I'm in the masculine now. Let's go. <laughs> we're, we're, in, we're, getting, we're getting the stride. So you guys put together something that you're going to offer yeah, people, which is amazing. Yeah. So we thought people may be curious about some of the things we're talking about. So we put together an audio that's an experiential process that you can do with your partner, similar to what we facilitated at Fit for Service. So you can just go to christinehaster.com slash sacred union and get it for free amazing yeah thank you you're welcome and i it love is, the process i think it's really yes yeah, it's, it's yeah it's yeah. Yeah. so 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 worth it yeah beyond mm. worth it it was mm. one of the most profound experiences of my entire life like mm. right up there with plant medicine Aww. it was extraordinary thank and you and as we did all of our you know i did all the whole round of wrap up and integration and all the zoom calls i talked to everybody afterwards um you know, it was one of the highlights of everybody's trip. And mm. for many people, it was the, mm. it was the highlight. And we did some amazing shit. We had an ecstatic dance with Parangi yeah. playing music. Oh we God. had, you know, breath work with yeah. eight of us guiding people under the, you know, magic of Bear Mountain wow. and the Red Rocks. We had a soul wander out on the land mm. where people were finding arrowheads and like mm. hieroglyphs and wow. crazy mm. seeing crazy animals mm -hmm. and having like encounters with, but overwhelmingly, like I would say the majority of people said, yeah that thing that everybody was you know looking forward to all these other things but that workshop you guys provided was just one of the most powerful experiences for everybody so mm -hmm. thank you for having us and yeah that's for what sure we, thank you for the honor of facilitating it because it guys and you guys fucking brought it you did you guys <laughs> i fucking, was not expecting that you guys <laughs> fucking brought it i remember i had a little <laughs> chuckle to myself you know internally when uh when you you were guiding us through that exercise and then the women were really going through that and you just you just talked straight to the men and you said men feel that and i was like damn yeah all right <laughs> like if yeah. i wasn't already like i for sure yeah. am now it was like you're like do not even think about not feeling this you're like not gonna let anybody skate by without letting that go in deep yeah. i was like you fucking get them steph yeah. you fucking get them <laughs> my, my my partner once we stood up he was so it was it, it was a really powerful experience for him and mm -hmm. and he just looks at me and goes this is intense. <laughs> <laughs> it's really deep. Yeah, really yeah really we just, deep. I mean, we just were like, we, we, we talked that morning about what we were going to do, actually, and I was feeling into the group, and I'm like, we can we can take them like we they're ready yeah. like yeah. it'll be uncomfortable, but this group they is ready and the energy and everything going on in the world like they can do it. They can do it. And they did. Yeah, they massively. Did. So much love and respect to the whole tribe. Who went Absolutely. Through that as well. All right, y'all. Thank you so much. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank I love you, you all so much. Love you too. Likewise. Goodbye, everybody. Peace. Thanks for checking out this video. For more like it, please subscribe to my channel. And of course, the Aubrey Marcus podcast with new episodes every single week. And follow me on Instagram at Aubrey Marcus. Thank you so much.